Good morning, Excellencies, Ministers, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming today. Uh, also to those of you who've uh, come from abroad to Copenhagen. Uh, we're very pleased that this conference has attracted such interest. Um, among us today, we have uh, uh, many distinguished uh, participants, uh, former Pr Prime Minister uh, Paul Jørg Rasmussen, who played a key role in, in some of the events that we're gonna uh, talk about. Uh, former Foreign Minister Per Stig Møller, who also played a key role uh, in, in the previous enlargement process, uh, and uh, a number of uh, ministers from uh, applicant countries, candidate countries around Europe. We look very much forward to uh, uh, getting your input in the course of uh, the conference uh, today. We've also got uh, a uh, uh, live stream uh, going um, with uh, uh, 100 plus, I think so far, uh, who uh, will be following uh, the conference um, uh, virtually. We're here today not only to mark the 30th anniversary of the Copenhagen criteria, we're also here to learn from earlier enlargements of the European Union so as to be able to apply the lessons learned to future enlargements. 30 years ago, the European Council, 12 heads of state and government at the time, met here in Copenhagen to adopt a set of conditions that all countries wishing to become members of the EU had to meet, the Copenhagen criteria. Just like today, Europe at the time had gone through sudden and radical geopolitical change, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Cold War, and just like today, European leaders made preparations for uh, enlargement of the European Union. The Copenhagen criteria are at the same time both simple and complex. Simple because they consist of three basic criteria, a political, an economic, and an administrative criteria. Complex because delivering on these three criteria takes an enormous effort on the part of the applicant countries. Establishing stable democratic institutions, rule of law, and a well-functioning market economy can't be done overnight. And adapting the EU's constantly evolving acquis is a daunting task in itself. Today's discussion will allow us to compare notes and gain some unique first-hand insights into the accession process. In the first session, we'll go back to 1993 and the adoption of the Copenhagen criteria and continue through the late 90s and 2000s to see how the criteria impacted the process leading to the accession of 10 new member states in 2002, a decision that was also taken at a meeting of the European Council here in Copenhagen. We will in particular focus on the lessons which can be drawn from the very successful accession processes of, of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, where Denmark played an active role in assisting the three countries in meeting the criteria. In our second session today, we will move to the present and consider how these past experiences can help us navigate the current enlargement process. There's much knowledge and experience to draw on. Then. In the third session, we'll turn inwards and look at how the EU can best prepare itself for the enlargements to come. It's not just the candidate countries that need to do their homework, so does the European Union. To be ready to welcome new members in the European House, we probably need to renovate it a little bit. We might need to adjust our decision-making processes we now might need to reform our policies and we might want to have a look at our budget. Thank you again for joining us here in Copenhagen today. I look forward to an interesting day full of insights and food for thought. I, I hope that this will feed into the discussions ahead of us as the enlargement process uh, picks up speed again. I think the issues that we're going to discuss here today will uh, be uh, discussed 
uh, in the weeks and months to come, uh, there's going to be a big discussion, I think, on some of these issues at the informal European Council in Granada in, in October during the Spanish presidency. So we're looking forward. And, and let me now pass the floor to Lykke Fries from the think tank Europa, with whom we have co-hosted this event. Thank you, Lykke, for, for uh, moderating the uh, conference. It works. Thank you very much, Carsten, and a warm welcome also from Think Tank Europa to all of you here and also those following us online. I had the Think Tank Europa, and I'll do my best to steer us through this day with nothing less than five keynotes and five panel discussions. One of my other daily functions is to co-chair the European Council of Foreign Relations, ECFR, with Carl Bildt and Norbert Röttgen, so I'm obviously very glad that two ECFR scholars are on the program and actually also a former one. Since we have no time to lose, for practical matters, I refer you to the sheet that we sent out on Friday. Let's start by backtracking to the 21st, 22nd of June, 93. How many of you actually remember where you were, specifically? Honestly, I don't. My full concentration as a young EU nerd was on how the Danish government could square the circle of respecting the no to its citizens to the Maastricht Treaty in 92 and making sure that the treaty was not dead on arrival. After all, ratification required unanimity. When that was settled with the help of uh, two speakers here today, I went on interrail. So I have no memory of the European Council in Copenhagen whatsoever, not to mention the Copenhagen criteria. You may now think that the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs have found the wrong moderator for this event. <laughs> but my pushback is rather convincing, I would say, because I have splendid company. Because rarely have nine lines on page 13 in a European Council conclusion played such an important role. And rarely were so few people aware of their importance when they were agreed upon. When I checked the Danish press before this event, it quickly became clear that there was basically no mentioning of the Copenhagen criteria. The core headlines at that time were the tragic events in the former Yugoslavia, unemployment rates in Europe, and the lack of transparency of the European Council. But that doesn't change the fact that, COPE, that the Copenhagen criteria became crucial in establishing the merit-based approach where your place in the enlargement queue is determined by your progress and not by your place on the map or your history book. And what was just as important, the Copenhagen European Council put an end to the debate which had waved back and forth since the first years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, should Central and Eastern European countries become full members of the European communities or rather be offered some kind of B membership, for instance, in the so-called All-European Confederation, as suggested by the French president at that time, François Mitterrand. In Copenhagen, there were no buts or caveats, because also on page 13, we have the almost iconic sentence, I quote, the European Council today agreed that the associated countries in Central and Eastern Europe that so desire shall become members of the European Union. Accession will take place as soon as an associated country is able to assume the obligation of membership by satisfying the economic and political conditions required, quote unquote. Exactly because it was a merit-based approach, the three Baltic countries got a large foot in the door. And that despite the fact that then-Chancellor Helmut Kohl, in a speech at Oxford in November 92, had ruled out the accession of the Baltics since they had been part of the Soviet Union. Well, even if the enlargement train left the station without me noticing, since I was busy finding the train from Rome to Munich, I did write my PhD on enlargement and coined the unofficial slogan of the Danish EU presidency in 2002, I should have as applied for copyright from Copenhagen to Copenhagen. And from Copenhagen to Copenhagen, 
was not just a snappy phrase. It actually became reality when another Danish EU presidency came full circle by concluding accession negotiations with 10 countries in Copenhagen, yes, on the basis of the Copenhagen criteria. Without becoming sentimental, I guess all that were present on the 10th of December 90, uh, 2002 sorry, in the Bella Center will never forget that day, as I'm sure that our two panelists in the first panel can confirm. I guess the only person that may not have recollection of that evening is probably the Queen of Denmark. <laughs> Throughout the entire European Council, the Danish presidency, headed by then Prime Minister Anders Fogh Rasmussen, did his utmost to finalize the negotiations on time. Indeed, a few months after the summit, a French official said that he had never seen a man looking that often at his watch since Dustin Hoffman in the Rain Man movie. <laughs> but despite this, there was some delay, and as a result, the official dinner at the Royal Palace was cancelled. Instead, the food was brought to us in the International Press Center, which set a whole new standard, I would say, for catering at European councils. Since then, the Copenhagen criteria have turned into the only show in town, the only rule book if not that detailed, if you want to join the European Union. Just ask Bulgaria and Romania, the two countries who joined in 2007, or Croatia, which followed suit in 2013. All the countries which have since applied for membership, from Albania over North Macedonia to Ukraine. But when I say Copenhagen criteria, I'm also referring to the fourth one, which is often forgotten. I quote once again from the Copenhagen European Council conclusions, and you have guessed it already from page 13. The Union's capacity to absorb new members while maintaining momentum of European integration is also an important consideration in the general interest of both the Union and the candidate countries, quote unquote. This criteria was later referred to as the EU's absorption capacity and contributed to nothing less than four new treaties, the Amsterdam Treaty, Treaty of Nice, then the Constitutional Treaty, which was stillborn, and the present Lisbon Treaty. It is not an exaggeration to say that enlargement enthusiasm at certain times was overshadowed by enlargement fatigue and skepticism. After all, the fear of the infamous Polish plumber, that is cheap labor from the new member states, not only played a lethal role in the French and Dutch no to the constitutional treaty, but also in the Brexit campaign. And so did the prospect of Turkey joining the European Union. And let's be honest, also here in Denmark, we had our spell of enlargement skepticism when the previous Danish government could not support the opening of accession negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia. So seen from that perspective, we have a lot on our plate, as also Carsten pointed out. How did the Copenhagen criteria come about and how were they perceived at that time? What role did they play in the transformation of, for instance, the Baltic countries and what lessons can be drawn for the present candidate countries? How are the criteria looked upon by the many candidates in the EU's waiting room? Are they a guiding light or rather boxes to tick? What do we do about the fact that not all countries live up to the Copenhagen criteria once they have become members? And of course, there's also the EU's so-called absorption capacity. Can an EU of maybe 36 members really function with a treaty that was agreed by 27? And what about the EU's common agricultural policy, regional policy, that will also be part of our discussion. And how do we avoid another phase of enlargement fatigue? To answer all these questions, we have a brilliant lineup, but I will already now apologize for not pronouncing all names in a correct way. So I hope that our speakers will be just as indulgent as me, because my name has certainly been pronounced in the strangest ways. Just take Madame Lockie Fries when I opened the climate change negotiation in Cancun in 2010. 
But we better get started, and we'll do that by looking back at the Copenhagen European Council in 1993, and also touch upon its importance for the Copenhagen European Council in 2002. So if my panel would uh, start to move up here and slowly, so I can introduce you, because we have a panel here on stage that is the uh, so-called P panel. Because we have Paul, Peer, and Paul. Can, can we sit up? Absolutely. And to be a bit more precise, Paul Nyrup Rasmussen, former Prime Minister of Denmark and President of the European Council in 1993. Per Stig Møller, former Foreign Minister of Denmark, and you played a vital role during Denmark's EU presidency in 2002. And finally, Paul Skøtte Christoffersen. And if I'm not mistaken, you must be one of the few persons, Paul, who played an important role in both European Councils in Copenhagen. In the first one, you were the right hand of the head of the Council Secretariat, the one and only Nils Ersbøl, and in 2002, you were the Danish chief negotiator. We have agreed that you will speak for maximum five minutes each, and then I'll take the liberty of asking you some questions. And since this is an all-day event, PPP, I will be a strict timekeeper. So, Paul Nyrup, first things first, congratulations on your 80th birthday. Although you look almost the same as 30 years ago when you chaired the European Council. But take us back to 93. In my research, I found the following quote by you. No, I couldn't imagine in 93 that enlargement would get this far. No one imagined that. I imagined more an expansion where two, two to four countries were accepted at the time. And you should also remember that in 93, not even the EFTA countries had joined. Quote, unquote. So what actually happened back there in 93? The floor is yours. I think, I think, no, I don't think I think, right? Don't think, uh, the function? Press the button, yeah. No. Can you uh, hear me? I think we better wait for the, uh, right. because people are following us online and they shouldn't miss yeah, your important right. points. This would never have happened, I think Europa's sort of not existing <laughs> premises, yeah? Otherwise, you may be able to borrow Piers de Müller's microphone. Would you accept that, Pierre? What a brilliant start of this conference. Um, Paul, what happened? Yeah, I think it's, it's uh, worthwhile going back and, and look at Europe at the time where we discussed the, the, this issue. You know, among politicians and especially heads of states and government, what's on the agenda is not necessarily the same as is on the agenda in the diplomacy. Uh, and at that time, it was the economic crisis, it was massive unemployment, mm. and it was the conflict in Yugoslavia, which really, really took uh, last thing uh, a lot of our time and, and uh, imagination. Uh, then on page 13, as Lukas said, uh, there was a small text on the Copenhagen criteria. Uh, I think it's, it's worthwhile uh, today that I start paying tribute to my former foreign minister, Nils Helby Petersen, who passed away some years ago. Thanks to him and his personal uh, engagement in uh, this question, we managed to do the text and to negotiate with our colleagues around in Europe. You know, uh, the situation was that a few years before, I think we tend to forget that, Lugge, there was a conference in Copenhagen in June 1990 among the Conference Security of Co Cooperation uh, in Europe members. Actually, there was around 30 member states who discussed what could we do a few weeks after the fall of the, the Berlin Wall. 
And they actually agreed upon a set of Copenhagen criteria, uh, including peace, security, but also rule of law, democracy, and economic stability. It was really appalling to see today that this text was fundamentally inspiring for the Copenhagen criteria text in Copenhagen in June at the summit in 1993. And, and Parallel to that, I think, we should also recall that this was the first time these few weeks after the fall of the Berlin Wall that NGOs were included in the conference. Actually, there was uh, 30 NGOs in, from different countries and there was a, a, um, a group of, of, uh, of um, decision makers consisting of Paul Hartling, of Anker Jorgensen, who guided this NGO group. So, Lüge, for the first time, International conferences included NGOs at that time. And the final outcome was the basis for beginning to negotiate with our colleagues all around Europe on the Copenhagen criteria. You can simply see today that the ideas brought up at that time in 1990, a few weeks after the fall of the Berlin Wall, inspired the text in the Copenhagen criteria document. Now, which role did it play? I think it didn't play any role in the discussion at, at the summit. No mm. one took the floor, not even Helmut Kohl. He, uh, he, was, he was quite sour at me because uh, um, I called him a few months before the summit and said, Helmut, we need to get uh, the, the Baltic countries on board because if we don't, I'm afraid that I'm not very fond of the final document. And then Helmut said to me, what are you doing at a Norwegian oil platform this Friday afternoon, Paul? You know, I don't like socialists, but you're among the guys which at least I can offer five minutes to listen to. <laughs> and finally, we agreed and, and Helmut once more showed that he is a European in first rank and he really deserved to, to stay there in our history mindset. Mm. He, uh, he understood that. Uh, Europe must be known on the basis of having a widespread uh, look at the member countries and he understood that insisting alone on Poland and Czechoslovakia at that time and others was too small and too un understandable. So if I should conclude here, look, I would say we understood at that time after having discussed on and backwards in the latest year who should go in, who should stay out. Some of the bigger ones, states in Europe said, we want this and this group, we don't want uh, the, the, the Baltic countries. Others said the opposite. So the only way of avoiding political discussions on our preferences for membership for these and those countries was to establish a set of objective criteria, which we did with the Copenhagen criteria. So in that sense, Luger, I think the most important recognition among states, heads of states and government at that moment was, oh, now we found a way of handling the enlargement process in the coming years. Excellent. And thank you all for reminding us of 1990, what happened there in Copenhagen, and paying tribute to uh, Niels Hebel Peterson. As already mentioned, you were PSD Müller for minister when Denmark had the 2002 presidency. In your latest brilliant book, Decisive Moments, Augerne Oeblige, I was wondering when I read that book, what about the uh, presidency 2002 and what happened at the Biller Center? Couldn't that also have been a decisive moment? Because when you look upon January, February, the year after, we were debating old new Europe and the war in Iraq. So what would have happened sort of if one had not agreed in Copenhagen? That's a cliffhanger, but I'm sure that you have many other points on your sheet of paper up there. Paul, Pierre Stimmel, the floor is yours. Let's see whether it works. No, it still doesn't work. The Minister of Foreign Affairs needs more money. You see, I'm not minister here anymore. It doesn't work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, uh, it was very, very important that we could make the enlargement in 2002. To me, it was obvious at that time that uh, you might get a revanchism from Russia. Uh, that's not because I'm a prophet, but I have sensed that in the Council of Europe in Strasbourg where well, the uh, Russian members of the uh, Council of Europe uh, were very, very angry with, uh, the Lat uh, with Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania that they had left the Tsar Empire. So it was obvious to me that someday this will grow. Uh, that's why here in this building, uh, Ukraine came here in 2002, it's very interesting, and uh, asked for be becoming 
candidate. I was for it, Denmark was for it, but the commission was against it. And uh, Prodi said to me, said to us, well, uh, Euro Ukraine is not a European country. Then I said, what about Turkey? Oh, they should never have been accepted, he said. So uh, Ukraine was lost in 2002 in the European Union. Now everybody wants it in. It has been a lot better if they got a candidate status in 2002. And, uh, and that's why for me it was very important what happened with Paul in 93. And uh, it was very important and necessary that we had a common flaw, which, is, which the Copenhagen criteria are the common flaw under Europe. Because here we stipulate what is necessary to become member of the European Union. And uh, we can see how important it is because without those criteria, uh, it would not be possible to say to Hungary, well, try to behave a little better and respect the democracy, democracy more. So we did not discuss them in 2002 because they were self-evident. Uh, but it was very important that we had them. And uh, also it was important that uh, you got the stabilization and association process that was also with you in 97. Because in this way, we told the aspiring countries that you have to be at peace with your neighbors. Mm. We do not import a conflict. We do not import a war. That was very important for the Western Balkans because there was a lot of uh, conflicts in the Western Balkans and border conflicts, minority conflicts. So it was important that we, they behaved well with the minorities, that there were no border conflicts which, between Croatia and the neighboring countries, for instance. And that is also important now when we talk about the coming process. We have Ukraine, we have Moldova, we have Georgia uh, waiting. And for them also it is important to have settled the conflicts with their minorities, uh, equal rights, that they have also uh, got rid of the border conflicts and neighboring conflicts and, sick and created peace. So in this way, the European Union is rightfully a uh, union for, for peace. And uh, for me, it was obvious in 2002, which you asked about, that we could not have, we had to bring them in, those T and the T10 and the next two, which were also decided upon in 2002, Romania and Bulgaria. We had to bring them in, otherwise you have the grey zones. And to me, grey zones were, this, were, were the same as green light for Russian military, mm. which has been, which we can see is, is the way it, it happens. So uh, for the peace of Europe and for those 12 countries, it was very important to be brought into the, our economic uh, community and our security community, I do know there's NATO and there's the European Union, but still, if you're a member of the European Union, you are more safe than not being a member of the European Union. Uh, so there were a lot of ideas behind it, but the fundament, the uh, flaw under the process were the Copenhagen criteria, which brought us from Copenhagen to Copenhagen. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. Also for the point about Ukraine, in my preparation for this conference, I read several books, and in one of them I found the following quote by actually Nils Hedvig Petersen. The three of them already knew, or the three of them sorry, really knew how to write just nine lines. They were almost carved in stone, so they would be impossible to alter afterwards. I think there were some colleagues around the table who underestimated the importance of the wording, but those words became immensely important for the later process. I will not ask you to uh, confirm that you played a major role in this poll, because I'm sure that the other poll also played a major role, but give us your view on the process from Copenhagen to Copenhagen, or whatever topic you'd like to talk upon. Paul Skøde Christoffersen. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I will try to cover the period from uh, uh, 89 to uh, uh, to today in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you F can do it. First, <laughs> first of all, after the fall of the wall and the freedom which spread to Central and Eastern European countries, I think the, the EU was quite rapid in providing financial assistance and trade concessions to help the new democracies. But Going back to 1990, there were nobody 
that wanted to use the word enlargement. Uh, you mentioned yourself that Mitterrand had certain uh, plans. I recall myself uh, Jacques Delors who talked about the European village where there were many houses. One of those houses was the European Union, the others were occupied by other uh, European states. All of that changed in the course of three years. Why did it change? Of course, there were political considerations, for instance, that uh, for Germany it was really not acceptable that the EU continued to enlarge towards the north or towards the south, mm. while their eastern neighbor were left out of the process. But the real reason why we could, in Copenhagen, take the basic decision that we are open for enlargement was because of what happened in the candidate countries. The progress made in the, in the Central and Eastern European uh, countries in the period from 89 up to 1993 uh, was really spectacular. And they used the structural funds, the uh, uh, trade concessions to an extent that we had not uh, uh, thought would be possible. So it was really a merit-based approach by the candidate countries that led to Copenhagen and to the decision to say, yes, we are open to enlargement with the associated countries. Small parenthesis, the Balt uh, Baltic states were not associated mm. members. But Paul Neo Rasmussen uh, had done his homework, including with coal. So we succeeded in another page than those you have mentioned to insert a phrase saying that we would start negotiations with the uh, Baltic states on achieving uh, an associated status. So they were not really in, but the traces were laid. Then I move rapidly up to um, the start of the negotiations in 1998 in uh, Luxembourg and ending in Copenhagen in December 2000 and, uh, uh, 2002. Five years. What did we achieve during those five years? We achieved, of course, the enlargement negotiations, but we also achieved a reform of the common agricultural policy. Uh, there was a very important shift in the common agricultural policy from price support to income support. Uh, we achieved to uh, make a budget for the uh, enlargement. We achieved reforms in the um, uh, in the uh, um, um, uh, structural funds, and uh, we did achieve an institutional reform, the Nice Treaty, in the middle of that. All of that, ten countries in five years. We can do it again provided that the merit-based approach, which was the foundation for the start of the process, is taken over by uh, the new candidate countries. And I must say that I'm personally um, optimistic in, in this sense. Final remark, and then we come to where we are today. Did we make mistakes? by the Copenhagen criteria? Uh, did we, should we not have foreseen what happened in Poland and Hungary? Mm. I don't think we could. I mean, when we sat here, not in this room, but in the Bella Center, and finalized the Copenhagen criteria, who would have thought that Hungary, after what happened in 56, Poland, 
after Solidarność and what had been true, that there would be a rule of law problem with those countries. But I do think that we should have done things differently after the candidates became members. One thing which struck me very much when I was permanent representative in Brussels before the enlargement was that when I had visits of trade unions or uh, all kinds of groupings coming from Denmark, I discovered that they had a personal relationship with people from the candidate countries. There was a people-to-people -people relationship in the period before enlargement, which was very important. Also, of course, relationship at the official level. I mean, uh, uh, all of that was dropped the day after uh, enlargement. We must not repeat the same uh, uh, mistake. Another mistake which we made, and you mentioned it to some extent yourself, Luca, and I will finish by that, <laughs> uh, was that there was sort of was the attitude that now they are members mm. and we don't need to deal with them anymore. They, uh, we brought, brought them into the EU, now we have our own problems uh, to solve. And I think there was a sensation in the candidate countries uh, that uh, they had sort of been forgotten in the period after enlargement, which has contributed to some of the problems. Okay, I better stop now. Excellent, but you covered 89 up to today, very impressive. Paul, would you please test it, this poll next to me? Would you please test the microphone, the other one on the table? Ah, it, it does work. Excellent. Uh, even if PSD is not, no longer foreign minister, it does work. Um, so that means that you are actually able to ask some questions. But, uh, Pierre, did you want to comment on something? No, no, no. No, no, no. Okay, okay. Um, do I see anybody who would like to ask a question? Otherwise, I have obviously a number on the list. Yes, and please state your name and affiliation. Do I see another one? No, then we go with you. Yeah. Yes, hello. My name is Uffe Wilker. I'm a chair of uh, Citizen Think Tank Europe Dialogue. And uh, I'm very happy that you were telling about NGO taking part of this, Paul Nyrup. Um, I want to hear your views uh, because Denmark has a special chance in 2025. We are e Danish EU presidency, we are candidate for UN Security Council, so we can combine the European perspective with a global perspective, for example, to do something about enlargement. So how do you see uh, Denmark's possibility to play a key role again in, in a few years? Another EU presidency coming up, although not in Copenhagen, I presume. Yeah. I think we, uh, in a sense, uh, have to begin, uh, Uffe, to discuss the elephant in the room, which means that, that it hasn't been mentioned up till now, but I think some of you recall that we had a proposal of a constitutional treaty at a time. Mm. And this constitutional treaty proposal was rejected, as you know. Yeah to referendums in France and Netherlands. And, and you know, the, the, the point here was that the Council foresaw that uh, as a, a ambition to have a full functional, decisive, uh, strong Council when we enlarge with 10 new member countries, we need to have a constitutional treaty which include a higher number of majority decision making um, and I think this, this need is becoming stronger and stronger. Um, I think our, our chair of, of this conference uh, indicated it hmm. in your comments, saying that maybe we need to look at some of our treaty decisions making uh, when we enlarge one more time. I'm a bit skeptical whether we can do it or not, but I will just say as, as my first answer, I see uh, a, a challenge and also an attractive challenge for Denmark to raise the question when the Western Balkans are coming on board, and I really welcome them. I need, I mean, I mean, 
this is no use of arguing that long for it. Look at the European map, think at the Copenhagen criteria, add these two, and the Western Balkans will hopefully be member in my lifetime. And that, I don't know how long that will be, but, but uh, it will be in the coming Very years, long, I, yeah. I assure you. No, no, my other ones, my, my answer to you was the Danish presidency will have an obligation based on the same success criteria which we have had in the past or our presidencies. I think we are among the smaller nations who may be capable of taking this elephant in the room without being shut down in a, in a second. Uh, Bill Clinton said to me at a Senate, just before a NATO enlargement meeting uh, many years ago when we discussed whether the Baltic countries should be a member of the NATO alliance or not and who should raise that question. And Bill looked at me and said, Paul, why don't you do it? Uh, because, uh, you know, you can get a no better than I can. Uh, and, and, and can I say that, that looking at the history of the Copenhagen criteria and the role this nation played with success and preparations and conviction is so attractive that I will just say, look at that, even discussing majority decisions and, and reforms of the treaty, I know how difficult it is, but we have to start that discussion one more time. Second point is uh, on the Security Council, just, just one small remark here. I think that, that uh, the actual Prime Minister of Denmark, Meta Frederiksen, really argues very convincing now on trying to understand the new uh, world order seem, seeming coming up now clearer and clearer. And, and, and what do I mean by that? Yes, look at the Mercosur countries, look at the Northern African countries uh, going up to uh, the Middle uh, Sea and, and our, our close neighbors to Africa. That's the second point I would say in, 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 2000, in, in 2025. I would really add to uh, our ambitions that we try to understand that the refugees crossing the, the Mediterranean will never stop unless we take the consequences of investing, investing and investing in the Northern African countries from Algeria to Morocco to onwards, because that will be the only way of trying to create a sort of new welfare states in these countries. We have, we have forgot it, we have closed our eyes, but these two challenges will fulfill the agenda in 2025. Thank Excellent, you. Pierre, and then Paul. Thank you, we'll see whether to, it works now. <laughs> ah, it was, I fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> of course you did. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a very important que uh, question we have got here. Uh, and this elephant in the room, Paul, uh, there's a habit of elephants to uh, smash the uh, China. That you destroy everything in the room with an elephant in the room. And uh, that is exactly what might happen. We have to continue the enlargement. That's a part of the European Union, the understanding, democracy and so forth, and no grey zones. I stand with that. But we then had to realize that we might be, have become too many to make it work. Uh, we get, we'll get more hunger, hunger is in. And Shiska uh, Destin and Helmut Schmidt, they made a common interview uh, just before the death of one of them. And uh, they said, in Copenhagen, we became too many. I'm glad that they made it. We became too many, they said. And uh, I don't agree with them, but they didn't think we could make Europe work with being so many. We have been able to do it, and we can see it in the conflict with uh, Russia that it really can work in the European Union, also in a conflict period. But if we then enlarge with eight or ten countries more, which will be the result at the end of the day, of course, Paul is right that then we need a new treaty, but my friends, you will never get it. There will always be one country which votes no, as it happened in 2005 when uh, even France and the Dutch did it. We did it in 1992. Uh, Ireland has done it several times. So forget it. You'll, you'll lose a lot of time, a lot of time preparing it, having the conference, all the speeches, all the travels, ending in nothing. So the presidency in 2025 uh, 20, uh, must find a way to make this work a common understanding of how we make the new, the existing treaty, the existing treaty work better. Having some gentleman agreements, some new rules of process, which we can bring through in the General Affairs Council, 
that is the only way to move on because we have to move on and we also have to change the decision making in foreign policy and security policy and that's very important but then we have to do it in a more uh, intelligent way than tr trying to make a new treaty because you will never get it in the security council i agree with 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 paul but this africa here also in 2025 we could work for the european union and the african union working together it's very very important that the african union uh, becomes stronger and to the future of Europe and the crossing of Mediterranean, which will, is nothing today compared to what it will become, then we really have to have an enlarged and deepened cooperation with Africa. And that must be European Union, African Union, which takes initiatives. Also, that's the job in 2025. Security Council, of course, there we had, when uh, we had the chance of sitting in the Security Council in 2005, 2006, the small country's privilege, which is the ability of moving between the big ones, which can't talk together, but they can talk to the, to the little one. So in the North Korea question and other questions and the military, uh, Middle East questions, the Denmark became a sort of, sort of broker because they all had con uh, trusted us. They knew we did not have special uh, claims and uh, potatoes which had to be roasted. Uh, and in this way, I think uh, the Danish uh, foreign policy and the diplomacy can really, really play a role on the uh, world scene in 2025. But that is understanding the processes, being accepted, having a conf uh, having um, relationships with all the other countries in the Security Council and outside it to uh, be an honest broker, which Denmark can be and was. So Africa, yes, European Union, yes, and uh, treaty, forget it, but make the one we have work better. Thank you. Paul, you had a comment, uh, and then also the other poll. Yeah, this, oh, just, sorry. Okay. just a very short one. On, too on, many polls at this yeah, stage. That's, uh, not <laughs> too ahead, yeah. Not too many in general, but. Yeah, OK, yeah, no, I agree, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Let's no, have a no, comeback my, for polls, my, yeah. My point, Luke, was, was, was to say also to you, Pierre, that, that uh, of course, I know better than so many I've lost a couple of referendums, uh, with dear friends. Uh, <laughs> but you that, won that one how, on how difficult it is. But but no, I'm saying that that we need to deal with this question in one way or another. Maybe the way to go is these these centric circles, you know, where a number of member states are are working closer together than than the other ones. We know that already in the pattern. But but my proposal would be, Luke, to say that we need to begin thinking constructively on that question in this room and among uh, partners in, in Denmark and Scandinavia and, and the present European Union establish a sort of working group which, which deals with this fundamental question. When the Western Balkans are becoming member and full functioning, we should have prepared a sort of how do we manage to be at least as dynamic in our decision process as we are now. And this is not a, a, a big uh, hallelujah on how we're deciding now you know that it takes time and often it takes too long time but my point is only let's get on board with this very very difficult question as soon as possible now the other poll well uh, 2025 mm. I need the, the technician yeah. Yeah. just give the mic let's just give the microphone Okay. Maybe for you too. Uh, just just you get your hands on it, it works. Uh, yeah. Now, yeah, yeah, 2025. Uh, it's uh, in two years' time. Uh, first comment the Danish presidency in 2025 will not have, as some had suggested, for our presidency in 2022 to have three priorities, enlargement, enlargement, and enlargement. There would be plenty to do in the Danish presidency in 2025, not least because it would be followed following uh, a Hungarian and a Polish presidency, uh, w which has its particular challenges. On enlargement and the Danish presidency, of course, in 2025, we will not be in the process of concluding uh, enlargement negotiations like we were in 2025. 
On the question of institutional reform, I think that we can count on our Belgian friends to make that uh, a priority when they uh, get to the table. So whether we like it or not, we are going to discuss that. On that issue, I, I, I do uh, agree that to have a general uh, convention, forget it, do uh, punctual changes. Let's recall that we have been through a crisis period where certain things could be adopted by a qualified majority, which cannot be adopted under normal circumstances by qualified majority, like certain taxation issues. Let's learn from that experience and say, we did it during the crisis situation, why don't we continue on that process? On the question of uh, foreign and security policy, since the Maastricht Treaty, we have had a way of introducing qualified majority voting uh, Let's do it. Let's do it. But I think the main topic for uh, the Danish presidency in 2025 in the context of enlargement will be budget and reform of community policies. Mm. 2025 will be two years before the present financial perspective runs out. It is at that time we need to do what the German presidency did before Copenhagen, also to look at the policies. We certainly need to look on our agricultural policies and as our experience at the time shown, it is possible to do changes. We will have to look at, for instance, when we are talking about Ukraine, the link which we are going to make between reconstruction and fulfilling the uh, uh, requirement for enlargement. There are plenty of topics which forms an agenda, reform EU policies, budget uh, with the perspective of enlargement, which uh, will give you enough on the plate. So now we all know what will happen in 2025. Uh, our time is almost up, but Pierre, you get the last word, also because you fixed the microphones. Thank you yeah. very much. Let's see whether I can make it work again. <laughs> yes. <Ooh. laughs> the wizard from Copenhagen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to add to, to what Paul said. Uh, Which one? Both of you. The Pauls. <laughs> yeah, the Pauls. <laughs> the Pauls. We have in Lisbon Treaty 2007, there we have seen the problems we have today because this is a chapter about enhanced cooperation. And that's exactly what you talked about, that we, if we make this enhanced cooperation work better, then we might solve the problem of how to move on. Because with the enhanced cooperation, nine countries can move on, then 12, and they, and they have to be open. It's not a club. They have to be open for the others. In this way, if they go the right way, they will get more and more adherence, and this way it will be changed without a new treaty, but with praxis. I think uh, the presidency should look into this uh, chapter about the enhanced cooperation. Thank you. It's been used three times. Okay, this uh, concludes our first panel, the Triple P panel. So let's give them a big hand of applause. And now it's time for some coffee. And uh, do be back at quarter past 11 for our first keynote, and that will be the Foreign Minister of Estonia. So once again, thank you very much.
start again. <laughs> det er den eneste måde, at jeg har kendt mig en klokke eller et eller andet. Jeg går lige op og lige op. Ja, So please find your seats. We are just about to start with the uh, Foreign Minister of Estonia. Otherwise you won't get any lunch. We are just about to start, so uh, please find your seats. Okay, I think we are about to start. Welcome back. It's now time for our first uh, keynote speech of the day, and I'm very happy to welcome the Foreign Minister of Estonia, Markus Tart. Now, you have held uh, many important decisions, uh, many important positions in the Estonian government, but I cannot resist from saying that you not only have a very forceful, strong voice in the uh, council meetings in, in Brussels, but uh, you must also have a very beautiful, vo beautiful voice because you won, won the second place in Estonian singing contest. So who knows, maybe you can do a sort of a, a spiel here <laughs> at the, the beginning. Uh, last time I heard you uh, speak and not sing was at this year's Leonard Mary uh, conference in Tallinn. And here I was also reminded of a quote by your former president. Compared to Russia, Estonia is like an Inuit kayak a super tanker takes 16 nautical miles to turn around, but the Inuit can do it, can do a, 100, a 180 degree in one dime. So, Mr. Foreign, uh, Foreign Minister, what role have the Copenhagen criteria played in your 180 degrees turn? The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, good uh, morning or afternoon already this morning. I was shocked about your remarks about my, <coughs> my past, and I really do hope that nobody is going to follow that. Uh, I was younger, and, uh, but now uh, we have a serious business to do, not only singing. But Estonia has been singing uh, free ourselves, so the singing is not a bad thing. But uh, to ladies and gentlemen and to friends, there are Paul uh, Nuroprasmussen, Dear Per Stig Müller, dear Paul Skutte Christoffersen, you are the founding fathers uh, of Copenhagen criteria and strong proponents of European Union enlargement. You have shaped the Europe and developed the European idea. And with, without you, we wouldn't probably gather here today. Allow me to express my sincere gratitude for the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Denmark and think tank Europe for bringing us all together here in the wonderful Copenhagen. Many great stories have been born here. Many big ideas have come to mind, like Sjøren Kierkegaard, who lived not far from here at Kogens Nytor and took his long daily walks across the city that he considered as one of the great social gatherings. Many paths and fates originated from very different corners of the world have crossed Copenhagen. Like the one of Velo Helks, 
a Danish-Estonian historian who had to leave his home in Estonia in the turmoil of the World War. He worked many decades not far from here in the Danish state archives, briefly also leading the archives as the deputy main archivist of Denmark. And for centuries, numerous adventurous journeys have started exactly from here, Asiatic Platz, former headquarters of Danish Asia Company, and now for the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. For slightly more than 10 years, the ministry was led by Uffe Jellemann Jensen, a great Dane, a great European, and a true friend of Estonia. He was a strong advocate for wider European unity and worked tirelessly for bringing back Baltic countries to European community. He was among the first ones who started to host the Baltic foreign ministers more than 30 years ago. It was obvious that they regarded Copenhagen as a natural gateway to the rest of Europe, wrote Elman Jensen himself in 2019. Therefore, I dare to say that also the journey of Estonia into European Union had one decisive starting point exactly here, where we are gathering today. Uffe, who possessed deep knowledge of Baltic history, having probably read also Velo Helk's work on Estonian history that was considerably popular in Denmark back in the days, saw clearly how brutally Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania had been treated in the past. This must not be allowed to happen again, stressed he firmly. Best way to provide the Baltic states a way forward was to integrate them to European Union and NATO as soon as possible. The outlook to rejoin euro atlantic community meant better, secure, prosperous and righteous future. Elman Jensen understood this and helped the others to believe in this despite initial skepticism and warnings not to rock the boat. Are you, it is similar for today, not to rock the boat, but uh, Elman Jensen really understood that it was time to rock the boat. <laughs> History has probably been the judge setting the truth criteria here. Yes, we Europeans are internally different in some ways. Our national cultures, languages, histories, GDP, geopolitical positions and ideas may differ, but it all has brought us and still brings us closer today and together. This is what Europe is about. This is what constitutes Europe and us. Close personal friend of Ulle Uffe Jelman Jensen, late Estonian president Lennart Meri, who himself embodied the continuity of Estonian statehood, was already in 1990 referring to the fact that Europe is a set of various equal ideas. And I quote, free exchange of ideas has brought Europe together and at the same time given every culture, every nation and every language its own tonality and purpose. Harmonious consonance of different colors is exactly European phenomena. This phenomena, as President Mary praised, has been despite all the challenges and even setbacks, unbelievably successful. For us Estonians, it has allowed to grow economically much faster than we could achieve alone. Through that, we have been able to invest in our security. In addition, we have gained a place at the table where crucially significant issues are being discussed and decided. Be it the pace of reducing carbon emission, setting telecommunication standards, shaping defense plans or European Union future enlargements. Estonia is a nation that values freedom and liberty. It is part of our identity, partly delivered from our history that is full of foreign rulers, oppression, deportations, and broken personal stories. These are not empty words, but core of our 
being as a human and society. We believe that the world is better off when its foundations lay on the basic freedoms. Estonia has proven to become one of the strongest liberal democracies in the world. Being the very top of in the freedom of the press, we are the eighth internet freedom, the second economic freedom, the sixth place, and the human freedom index, we are the third. And being a member of the union has largely made this possible has been our guide and inspiration. It also shows that change is possible. Hopefully, it's an encouragement to others. Unfortunately, there is an unique distribution of freedom in the world. The state of freedom in the world is fragile, including some of the countries in our region where rights and freedoms are under attack, like Russia and Belarus. It is an alarming development derived from the global crisis and insecurity that have fed populist movements and fostered radicalization. This tendency has to be reversed. There is a conviction that democracy is the best base for solid long-term solutions, that democracies are stronger and better prepared to face the future and ensure prosperity of individuals and peoples. Granting and protecting civil and human rights for everybody is unfortunately constantly under threat. It shouldn't be like that. Nobody should suffer discrimination or persecution due to her or his sex, race, religion, sexual orientation or national identity. Estonia aims to keep these issues constantly under a spotlight in order to acknowledge the shortcomings and to counter them decisively. This means also our firm support to LGBT community. And yesterday, Estonian president announced the same-sex marriage law. Dear ladies and gentlemen, having immensely gained and benefit ourselves from the EU and NATO integration, we have stood since day one for bringing other partner countries closer to the organizations. Let us turn to aspiring partners fishing to break away from the brutalities of the past, from lies and hatred, from suffering and injustice, aspiring to live free and prosperous. New partners are on their way to European Union. Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Albania, North Macedonia, Kosovo, Bosnia Herzegovina, Montenegro, and Serbia need friends like Baltic countries had Uffe Jelleman Jensen. I believe that today's conference is the best proof that those countries have many friends all over Europe who, whose actions speak louder than their words. The European Union has shown a firm unity by standing behind Ukraine in countering aggression. This unity is based on European coherence that we have been carefully building for decades. This unity has been possible because of the solid foundation of the Union that entitles Copenhagen criteria at its core. This unity lays also greatly on previous enlargement rounds. Ukrainian fight is existential for Europe. The future of Europe and its security is at stake. European Union has acted quickly, decisively and resolutely. The response has been multifaceted, raising the cost of aggression by implementation of the 11th uh, sanctions package is unprecedented in rage and depth. European Union member states have supported Ukraine military both by bilateral means and as a union through, for example, European Peace Facility. European Union is launching collaborative procurement of ammunition, which means first and foremost quick delivery of 155 millimeter artillery rounds. As Mr. Porel has said, European Union is breaking a taboo and unlocking the potential of European cooperation. 
European Union is not only about agriculture anymore. This is military as well and innovation. In addition, European Union has supported Ukraine with direct financial support. Last year, EU provided Ukraine with uh, 67 billion euros in economical, humanitarian and military support. This year, European Union will cover 18 billion euros of Ukraine's running costs. Not to mention wide range of reconstruction in initiatives that are gaining pace of various levels. It all provides that the European Union is standing up for Ukraine for as long as it takes, as Madame President von der Leyen has stated. Every country must have the right and opportunity to choose its security arrangements and allies. Everyone must understand and respect this. Any suggestions of the opposite would bring back the politics of the swears of influence, and we cannot accept that. The idea that some countries might have privileged interest over others must have no place in international relations. This principle belongs together with another outlook that we consider as vital for after-war stability. Namely, future peace should lay on the principle that there are no grey areas because they are simply not work. On the contrary, we have seen numerous times in the past how grey areas only breed wars and instability. Future peace should ensure that and every nation should have a right to choose where to belong and with whom to share the future. As I said at the beginning, European Union and NATO, with their various enlargement rounds, have clearly increased the st stability. Therefore, the path to these organizations must remain credible, open, for everybody willing and ready to join. Ukraine has chosen to become a member of European Union and NATO. As the focus of today is on EU, allow me to stress a few points that I find crucial for the future enlargement process. Ukraine is well on track fulfilling the seven benchmarks set by the European Union Commission, but we are on not there yet. Ukraine has to keep up the good work with maximum support from Estonia and, and all the other partners. When the benchmarks are met, then our strong conviction is that it is in EU turn to deliver by opening accession negotiations, hopefully by the end of this year. Before that, let us use all the tools at our disposal in bringing Ukraine closer to EU. From gradually integrating into the internal market to including Ukraine to various EU circles and initiatives. Membership application by Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia definitely invigorates the enlargement process. This had positive and encouraging effort also in Western Balkans. A year ago, finally, the accession negotiations with North Macedonia and Albania were opened. We all remember probably the path that both of those countries had to go through to reach to that point. It was not easy at all, but their success are another proof of the positive transformation. It is possible to navigate through the shallow waters and leave the dangerous reefs behind for good. Of those, one of those reefs is Russian disinformation and hybrid activities. Russia has a long tradition of distorting uh, the truth and false narratives. Baltics and a number, number of other countries have, on the other hand, long experience countering those lies. Despite of years long explaining and warning, we had to hear, unfortunately, too often how we are cyber rattles provoking Russia. Genocide and terror that Russia is conducting against Ukrainian boys and girls as we speak have silenced those voices, hopefully without a way back. At the time of aggression dialogue, economic and cultural cooperation, Russian athletes completing, competing internationally, all that is only supporting Russian cause and nurturing their war machine. We have developed strong response against Russian aggression because what Russia does goes against all the values that European Union is based on. Therefore, we expect full alignment with common foreign and security policy from the candidate countries. It shows a clear commitment of really aiming to become a part of European community. 
And what is especially important to emphasize in this context, change in direction and reforms taken by the candidate countries are above all something that the countries themselves are hugely benefiting from. We have experienced that. Reforms that support the transformation in the spirit of Copenhagen criteria are not meant to face and please the European Commission or any individual member state, but to move forward as a countries and communities, as democracies. It is the way how to develop the society, how to increase its resilience and the people's standards of living, how to strengthen the internal cohesion of every individual country and Europe as a whole. European Union itself must, of course, act decisively in responding to advancements of, the, advancements of the partner countries. We must live up to our promises, so it is also a matter of our own credibility. I know that I'm running out of time. Otherwise, I'll ask you to sing. I, I believe that EU <laughs> so enlargement. Wrap it up. <laughs> I, I believe that EU enlargement and further integration is strongly embedded into the future of European Union. So the formula for successful enlargement is quite simple: candidate countries must have to do their own, and EU its own part. Copenhagen criteria is the frame of the whole package. It is, defines who are and how we function. Our common path so far have proven that meeting the criteria strengths, strengthens the union and really stabilizes the boat that was not meant to be rocked. Dear friends, we may of course ask if it is justified to discuss European integration when Ukraine is fighting for its territory and sovereignty. But I believe that Ukraine itself has given a perfect answer here. The agility of Ukrainian European Union integration during last month is a true inspiration. It has proven that European Union integration is possible during wartime. Not only possible, but also it is successful. Having a clear perspective of joining the European Union is functioning as stimulus and motivation in pushing back the aggression. Ukraine is fighting for Europe, for the future, we ever closer and enlarged union could be reality. With a discussion on how advanced uh, with the EU integration in Western Balkan or Eastern Partnership countries, we build Europe coherence that serves Ukraine fight. It is not too much to admit that also the future and the fate of Copenhagen criteria is being decided in Ukraine right now. We will be able to gather also for 40th, 50s, or 60th anniversary of the Copenhagen criteria. I do believe in that. Furthermore, what kind of European Union we will be living in? I wish that it would be a union where the Copenhagen criteria preserving democratic governance, adherence on rule of law, respect of human rights and following the market economy are still relevant and central as the core principle and foundation for every stronger union. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And thank you very much. That was our first keynote. And uh, now we move to our second uh, panel. Uh, you mentioned uh, Uffe Ellemann Jensen a couple of times, so I cannot resist from telling an anecdote, which tells you a bit about the Danish-Baltic uh, relationship. In August 91, a few days after the chaotic coup against Mikhail Gorbachev, Denmark acted swiftly and re-established diplomatic relations with Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. One day after that decision, on a Sunday, the phone rang at the foreign minister's home, well, Uffe Ellemann's home. It was the foreign minister of Germany, Hans-Dietrich Genscher who was rather upset by Denmark's decision since member states in the council had agreed that one should act together. Why didn't you tell me, Hans Dietrich said, because then you would have stopped me, Uffe said. And a few days after, Germany followed suit. So this tells you a bit about the fact that small nations can sometimes be great powers, but back to our Baltic experience, I would now like to invite my Baltic panel up here, please come. <laughs> So, thank you very much. 
We have the former foreign minister and minister of defense of Latvia, Artis Papryx, and we have from Estonia and the academic world, Katri Lik, and uh, we have decided or agreed upon that you speak for five minutes each. I'm looking for a representative from Lithuania, but uh, apparently we may have some problems with, with the plane. Um, so, but we have a splendid panel anyway up here. So, Artis, you are now chairman of the Northern Europe Policy Center in Riga, and I should not really say welcome to you. I should say welcome back, because as we just spoke about earlier, you wrote your PhD at the University of Copenhagen, but still that's okay, at the University of Aarhus. So the floor is yours. What can we learn from Latvia and what can particular candidate countries learn from Latvia? The floor is yours. Uh, I, I forgot to say that. But this is not a red light district, but you have to wait for the red light before you yeah. speak. So let's just see whether it works. Ah, now the red light. Yeah, the floor is yours. Okay, I wanted to ask Per already to help, you know, my <laughs> friend and former okay. colleague. Well, yes, uh, I'm really pleased to be back in uh, Denmark and also in Copenhagen, which is my second country at least. And uh, I am really grateful to Danish education system, uh, Aarhus Setskunskab, and also my old friend Uf Helman Jensen, which was mentioned several times here. Um, uh, and uh, I would say that uh, my time in Denmark uh, was actually um, having a quite a big impression on uh, my general uh, lifestyle, value system, and etc. Because while you, like uh, Per, Paul, and others, were discussing Copenhagen criteria, I discovered those criteria already while studying. And when I returned to my country, I figured out that actually I gained maybe uh, some uh, 15 years uh, in my life becoming younger compared to other um, uh, people in my generation. So, so that's what Copenhagen criteria criteria does, it makes you younger. Now, um, as far as our experiences and, and Latvia, and of course, um, I really agree with what uh, Estonian um, former president um, uh, told about this kayak, because for small country and for us in Latvia and Baltic countries, um, the choice to join European Union and to join uh, NATO was basically done at the beginning of 90s, 92, 93, where we understood that if we are not joining European Union and Copenhagen uh, and uh, NATO, then uh, basically our future is already decided. So we needed, first of all, security from Russia, from Soviet Union, post-Soviet Union, and then we could implement all the reforms. And if I try to compare Copenhagen criteria for our society with something what humans are going through, it's something like you have been unjustly imprisoned for a long, long period of time, and then you're coming out of your prison, and then you're discovering that the world has moved somewhere, and you have, you have to reintegrate in that society. And this is what we have been doing in a very smooth time, because basically uh, as soon as those lobbies and supporters of us supported us in, 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 in those days in European Union, Latvia actually completed, just like Estonia and Lithuania, uh, adjustments to Copenhagen criteria somewhere in less than three years. I think it was 36 months. This is what we did. Why? Because, first of all, we had an iron motivation. We understood we have this window of opportunity, we have to use this. And secondly, of course, a part of motivation, we understood that this is where we actually belong. It was like re-founding, um, uh, reviving our own identity. Now, um, if we are looking uh, at this moment for for the advices and, uh, and, and what we can learn from our um, processes of, of adjusting to Copenhagen criteria. I would say that we understand in Riga, in Tallinn, in Vilnius very well uh, what Ukrainians think. Because in many ways, uh, uh, their road to European Union and also to NATO is the only way how they can survive. And in fact, this is the only way how we can preserve the peace, stability and prosperity in Europe. Because uh, it was our duty here uh, within EU and NATO actually to speak in the last year and also before about what kind of threat totalitarian regime of Russia possesses against all of us. And for us as a border country, 
uh, in many ways also Denmark is not uh, very far, it is um, of a fundamental survivor nature. Because if we will not, if Ukrainians will not this war, we will be the next. And the next will be all of us, not only Latvia, it will be Denmark, it will be Germany, it will be France, anybody. This is why, for instance, we are among uh, per capita actually the biggest donors to, to Ukraine, also militarily and, and socially. And I, when I heard the previous panel, I very much think that at this moment what we have to do, we have to actually unite our forces in the Baltic Sea area between the Nordic countries and Baltic countries and actually think already how can we assist with survival, reconstruction of post-war Ukraine. And I think the benefit, and Churchill always told, you know, never miss a good crisis. Mm. This war is a good opportunity because we can, if we are um, really putting our efforts, we can not only um, restore Ukraine, but through restoration, we can make the society to adopt to those Copenhagen criteria and to those principles which are needed in Europe. So this is a great opportunity. Another thing is what is important and where Baltic countries and our experience, either through government or NGOs or business people is valuable, for instance, for uh, such a um, reconstruction of Ukraine, is that we have understanding of both sides. We have been pupils and we are the teachers. We know how the West West thinks and with West West they understand countries more to the West from us because we are also West in that case. And we also understand the countries which are to the East from us. So in certain sense we know what they think, what they can imagine because they have been also, let's admit, they have been also mistakes uh, also on donor countries, on those which have been setting the principles of Copenhagen. Because if I am now returning uh, backwards and, and trying to think what were all those advices, not only from Brussels and capitals, but also from those who implement Copenhagen criteria, but also from all the institutions around, if we would follow every advice what was given to us by the West, West, we might end up also in extremely difficult situations similar to Ukraine. Hi. <laughs> and um, and uh, for instance, uh, the question of minority rights, which we have been struggling for a very long time, um, uh, also around Copenhagen criteria, they were not really understood in a sense in many uh, uh, countries of EU in those days because they could not grasp uh, actually how Moscow was arguing. And we can see it now how Moscow actually is using uh, NGOs, businesses, money in many of European countries actually to set their own agenda. And in those days, of course, they were not interested that we actually join European Union and NATO. This is why they were trying to figure out how to make um, uh, heard by different types of influencers, academicians, politicians, and they still do this. Only now, of course, our eyes are more open. Now, I'm going to finish <laughs> and just, uh, just the last uh, few sentences. I think uh, by uh, by um, keeping this into mind and uh, uh, for us as a border country, it's highly important that uh, future European Union is strong. So yes, we have to refurbish and reform something, but we have to do it carefully because Copenhagen criteria is an average criteria. Mm -hmm. Each and every country has their own uh, small intentions and their past and present, present and tomorrow. We have to also bear that in mind while adopting ourselves or while speaking with accession countries. Secondly, we have to do it along with really activating, I think, our policy in Africa and versus China, because both are actually a very, very um, important uh, regions from which depends our global way. But first, we have to win the war, which Russia is uh, waging against Ukraine, it's waging against Europe and us, and it's waging actually against Copenhagen criteria. Thank you. What a brilliant sort of end. And I think our P panel confirmed your point that uh, Copenhagen criteria can keep you young. Uh, and uh, Warm welcome. Uh, I apologize for the airport here, Kastrup. There are some, there are some problems. Uh, we now have the great honor of having the uh, former chief negotiator for Lithuania's accession talks with us. At that time, we met a couple of times, also because my uh, boss, Ambassador Pierre Carlsen, uh, 
who should also be mentioned here at this conference, uh, was always sort of very sort of uh, active with regards to Lithuania. One could say that his heart was definitely in the Baltics. And talking about hearts, you are now a member of the European Parliament, and one could be tempted to say that you are therefore at the heart of Europe. But I once made the mistake by saying that, so I'm not repeated, because the geographical heart is in Lithuania, 26 kilometers from Vilnius. I even checked it out myself. So um, now that you're here, what uh, lessons can be learned from the uh, Copenhagen criteria seen from your perspective? And you have to wait for the uh, uh, red sort of circle. I'm sorry about this. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody, and thank you to, uh, for organizers to inviting me and uh, having this opportunity to exchange with you on um, Copenhagen. And we're not speaking about past. Although Copenhagen criteria is 30 years old, we're speaking about present and uh, I believe still about future. Because enlargement is back. It never was out of the agenda, although suspended for some time. But I think we have uh, many reasons to speak and to reflect and to make some conclusions which um, are very relevant for today. You know, after the collapse of uh, Soviet repressive regime, and once again I have to, <laughs> speaking on behalf of the Baltic uh, colleagues as well, uh, we've never been a part of the Soviet regime, we've been occupied countries, captive nations, all right? So don't call us former as we don't call uh, many countries which were former colonies. Simply skip it. Reflect reality rather than uh, unpleasant past. So, I mean, if you out of the prison cell, we haven't been uh, on equal footing with the Central Eastern European countries, in particular with Visegrad. And for Baltics, uh, it was uh, an extra task to you know, come up to the level of, uh, indeed, enlargement league. Once Poland and uh, other countries uh, were speaking equally as equal to equal to uh, the European Commission and uh, uh, some member states, we still had to make some extra mile in order to catch up and to present ourselves um, as to be equally treated. It didn't come uh, without any cost, and it took time. You know, there was no experience, I mean, to take uh, former captive nations to the European Union, and how come? Just yesterday, you've been uh, having this title former, and now, I mean, you are seated to the negotiations table. It's impossible. It's impossible. Social, uh, social uh, uh, stamps and kind of heritage is really a very heavy one, but so having in mind, I mean, we've been uh, pushing uh, uh, our membership and uh, relationship with the European uh, communities at that time uh, as much as I could. And the major, in fact, uh, breaking point happened in Copenhagen, not just because of the Copenhagen criteria, as uh, I would say a major strategic roadmap was adopted, but we've been invited, three of us were invited to negotiate Europe agreement as a major framework agreement uh, for accession at that time, including free trade agreements. Mm -hmm. So we had to jump uh, through some stages and to come uh, <clears throat> to the accession in a, a bit different, uh, different way. Uh, what, was, um, what was important uh, uh, for us? Um, for Lithuania and other Baltics, uh, it meant uh, accelerated path of reforms and quick delivery. You can reform but have no results, all right? <laughs> <laughs> and we see, in case of some uh, candidate countries, for too long. And we, we shouldn't appreciate this. I mean, it's, it's a great problem. It's a great political problem for those societies and for the European Union. Both are guilty. Both are involved. It's one game, one ball on the field. Uh, so, but we had to deliver and we had to come up, as I said, to this league of enlargement as quickly as possible, not losing our 
quality of transformation. Because transformation, you know, I mean, those countries having experience of transformation, <laughs> it's not an automatic process. <laughs> Try to transform your family life. <laughs> and you will see yeah. one household social economic life, trans transform it. I mean, make some changes and you will see how, how, how much it takes, not just to financially to uh, redistribute uh, uh, money, but uh, um, uh, intellectually, I mean, to agree among uh, ourselves. So that's why what we did, uh, and we did it in a, in a good way, by the way, um, by being guided by the Copenhagen criteria, which is very useful, by the way, although very abstract, and thanks God, it's abstract. Why? You know that before uh, Council met in, in Copenhagen, there were some proposals, for example, to include into economic criteria some uh, qualitative, qualitative standards, like level of privatization, state, uh, uh, state uh, uh, in-depthness, and the rest. It would be a catastrophe. As we can't agree now in the European Union, I mean, what, what should be the level, let's say, general level of uh, um, um, those uh, criteria? But at that time, it would stop enlargement uh, indefinitely. With no any step forward, even to agree on the concept of a social, uh, social market economy. There is no common understanding about social eco uh, market economy in the European Union. Take Scandinavian countries, take Latin countries or Central uh, Eastern European countries. Huh? So I think it was a God blessing. I mean, uh, uh, we had this abstract de description, rather abstract description of the uh, Copenhagen criterion. And finally, lessons. First, to keep enlargement, um, meaning accession and negotiation process, result-oriented, not procedures-based not procedures based. If we are to speak about some new uh, procedures, I mean, we will be, uh, you know, forgotten in history with uh, no results. And clear and fewer principles and less technical details. Technical details will be decided by negotiators and those who write uh, final uh, legal, legal documents. Secondly, more partnership and less patrimonial approach. More partnership, eye to eye. All right? Speaking, inviting, explaining, doing together, rather than lecturing from uh, uh, high podiums and so on. Twinning is a gold example for me. Structural dialogue, it failed because it wasn't too practical and efficient. So those examples should be remembered by us and not to um, repeat it in, 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 in future. And finally, transformation and efficient reforms of exceeding countries is a common good and interest. Common good and interest. It's not up to those countries to deliver. It's up to us together to be engaged and to reach that result. I mean, because enlargement is a strengthening, in particular now, in those geopolitical circumstances, as uh, my Latvian colleague rightly said, Ukraine predecides our destiny and security. So that's why we, we have to have in mind something different geopolitical in this regard. So that's why thanking you for invitation. Uh, I think uh, Copenhagen criteria started its life here in the city. <laughs> it ended well with us in 20, 2002 in December. I remember those days, mm. excellent days. I mean, <laughs> more than Christmas, <laughs> it was. <laughs> Christmas after Christmas party, indeed. Uh, <laughs> and um, wedding day. And indeed, uh, a kind of the uh, engagement and then wedding day. And so um, the, the, those gr great achievements, I'm looking forward for uh, our exchange and uh, commitment for future. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very Thank much. You. And uh, I never had thought about the fact that Copenhagen criteria can also be used at home, so I have to think about that. One of the assets about being co-chair of the European Council of Foreign Relations is that I always get the chance of uh, debating Europe with the best and the brightest, and now I give the floor to Katri Lik, and you are a specialist uh, on Russia. You are a Russia watcher, but you are also Estonian, so the floor is yours. 
wait for the red. Oh, come on. Yeah. Yeah. red or ministry? Yeah, that works. works. Either red or ministry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And thank you very much for including me. I'm indeed a Russia watcher. So when I was invited here to talk about Copenhagen criteria, I double checked a couple of times. Are you, are you sure you want me? Uh, and then I was uh, reassured that I'm indeed welcome. Then I, I tried to do some homework. Um, I googled Copenhagen criteria. I tried to read Estonian newspapers from the old times. Um, to look back at the process. And to be honest, I think when Copenhagen criteria were formulated in 1993, I'm not sure Estonia really wanted to join the European Union at all. I mean, most of us didn't quite know what it was, and having just emerged from the Soviet Union, chose to be cautious about anything that had a word union in its name. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but we wanted to join NATO, full-heartedly, passionately. For us, it was all about security, about the trauma of 1939-1940, and, and making sure that risk can never, ever be repeated. So. I think it's fair to say that in the early days, European Union was treated as a backdoor into NATO in, in the Baltic states, because European Union was where we could get in, NATO was not possible yet. Only later on, I think we discovered that European Union is a big thing in itself, and, and actually, you are truly part of the European family in the EU not if you are just in NATO. So I, I, I believe we have since become good Europeans. Uh, I trust we have been relatively good. But that was not to be taken from granted uh, early, early on. <coughs> but adopting Copenhagen criteria were really easy for us. I, I called up some politicians, diplomats, journalists who were active back in the 1990s, I, I asked them to tell me about our story with Copenhagen criteria. Did we have some big screw-ups? Are there any hilarious accidents, anything? Nothing interesting turned up. <laughs> I mean, yeah, a few things, but not even interesting to mention here. Um, it was really straightforward. And I think one explanation could be, at least in Estonia's case, I think for a couple of decades after 1991, um, democracy was actually linked to independence in, in our psyche. There was a perception that having imperfect democracy in, in 1930s led to us giving away the country. There was perception that there was media censorship, things were not debated, uh, president didn't listen to, to the elites, um, rightly or wrongly, that was seen as having led to Soviet takeover. And that's why the society as a whole was really allergic to any sort of example of, of non-democratic tendencies. Openness was linked to democracy. That's not maybe typical, maybe not, not the case everywhere, but for us it was, and that's what made it easy, uh, the Copenhagen criteria. I remember at one press conference President Leonard Mary was asked, you know, if you wouldn't, if, if you were not invited to the European Union, what would you do differently? And he said we would do exactly the same things. And that was, of course, the right answer at the right place. It was broadcast all over the world. I think he would have said so anyway, because he was good with smart, snappy replies to journalists. But that one happened to be the truth as well. I, I, I believe the Baltic states would have done everything relatively the same way. Nonetheless, Copenhagen criteria were still highly useful. I mean, they provided a checklist um, against 
which to work, and they made the process measurable, objective, and that was really important for politics uh, because you know, politic membership was a politically sensitive question that was mentioned already in the first panel. Many countries had their doubts, um, but if membership was based on objective criteria, that made it easy for us because we knew we could reform faster than, say, Poland, and Poland was to be included in any case. So Estonia's then foreign minister, Thomas Ilves, um, his strategy was, we need to be better than Poland, and we need to make everyone aware that we are better than Poland. The second was sometimes harder than the first. In addition, we wanted to be better than Latvia and, and Lithuania, but you know, that also yeah, right? that's, that's what you do. That, that comes <coughs> with passport. Um, <coughs> and we were lucky. We, um, we had good neighbors to emulate. Um, I think the role for Estonians, at least, of Finnish TV uh, should not be underestimated. I mean, we would watch that throughout the Soviet years and we, wa we wanted a society like, like, like in Finland or in Sweden, where many of us had relatives. Um, and the Nordic countries helped us. Not, not everyone is, is so lucky with neighbors. And somehow we were lucky also with political processes. I mean, some things were decided already before the Copenhagen criteria. I mean, we had free and fair elections. Uh, we had proper privatization uh, based on uh, workable legislation conducted uh, transparently. That meant that there were no vested interests in politics or economics that would have proved problematic to manage in, in, in the case of uh, in the course of reforms. Um, so I'm that was good. Close. <laughs> yes. And as I said, it really worked for us. We, um, we reformed, we corresponded to the criteria, and we got what we were promised. If I'm thinking of the downsides, then I think the downside might be that maybe we are treating democracy, thanks to that, too much as a ready-made blueprint. Uh, something that is there as a default uh, condition for the world. If you just remove the bad guys, then democracy will take root. Mm. But that is not the case uh, necessarily, as American intervention in Iraq demonstrated. Democracy takes many shapes and forms, and, and sometimes I wish we in the Baltic states that we would think about democracy sort of as if it were a new thing, but we would look at it the way, I don't know, Icelanders were discussing democracy when they were setting up their first parliament in 930, <laughs> or, or uh, Can Archbishop of Canterbury when he was writing uh, Magna Charta in 1215. Uh, I mean, they all were sort of setting up democratic system because they thought that was something, that was a good thing to do and, uh, and a new thing. So I wish the Baltic states, you know, we, we adopted the criteria shaped by others. We should understand that it's people who shape these things too. And, and we should adopt our place among those folks. And also in politics and diplomacy, I, I really admire what, what Denmark did. I mean, the discussions you had in the earlier panel about how Denmark shaped the process, it was privileged to listen and, and, and great feat by a small country. Uh, likewise, I have always admired and often brought the example of uh, Sweden uh, under the premiership of Carl Bildt, how he helped Baltic states to advance to uh, the Russian troops to withdraw. And I, I, I wish the Baltic states, I think it's, we still are about to do something similar. I mean, we, we weigh in on many questions, noisily, forcefully, but I think we are not 
quite as thoughtful diplomats and coalition builders as as you have been. So very from pupil to teacher. Clearly, yeah, yeah, things to yeah. things to learn. Though that said, reskills actually seem to be deteriorating all over Europe. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> We now have uh, five minutes left. Who would like to ask a question? Yes, here. Please stand up. Yeah. Hello. Works. My name is Maria. I'm from the Social Liberal Party, working on um, defense and security. And I'm really interested in uh, comparing EU paths in the Baltic countries to the EU compared to Poland and Hungary and what makes the difference of the challenges we now see with Poland and Hungary uh, compared to the not so much pragmatic uh, things we see with the Baltic countries. Do I see another question? Then we go with that and uh, well we have four minutes left so uh, Feel free to answer whatever you want, basically, but obviously answering the question. Tenor, how was that? It ah, is now okay. you, um, <laughs> you okay, are a good, well, uh, good pupil. Well, I, I think that we actually have to be very careful uh, to judge the things also in those countries, because I would say that Poland and Hungary is uh, different cases with each other. There are quite big differences. About uh, Hungary, if I may say, um, as not being politician anymore, I, <laughs> I, I sometimes have, a, let's say, a difficulty to comprehend their current position. But if you look to Poland, then I think that uh, somehow internal politics um, a little bit remind at this moment policies in, in US where basically society is divided 50-50 and how much it is actually about genuinely against or for Copenhagen let's say criteria it's still a big question but we must remember that Poland at this moment plays extremely crucial role in support against totalitarian Russia without Poland things would be extremely different so we have to give them uh, applause at least about that Macron, President Macron the other day said in Bratislava, we should have listened to Eastern Europe more. Are we listening enough today? Would be my question. Um, and where are we not listening? Kadri and then Petrus. So where are we not listening? Well, <laughs> mm. We may be listening enough. I mean, that could also be a theory. Yeah, well, I'm tempted to advertise uh, a future commentary by me <laughs> by, <laughs> where I try to analyze what are the things that Baltic states and Eastern Europe actually was in the position to know about Russia and, and what were the things we didn't know. We, we clearly had experienced that Russia doesn't view its smaller neighbors as proper countries. They view them as someone's vassal states. Ample of evidence of, of, of that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we foresee that war coming or that we had good recipe um, to prevent it. So I still think that when we discuss you know, shaping European policy, then actually we should rely on, on everyone's experience. It's not that our experience is automatically so much better than everyone else's. I, I don't quite subscribe to, uh, to that view. Excellent. Petrus, what's your view, your two cents on that? Yes. Your final statement? Yes, indeed. <laughs> you know what? Uh, I'm most afraid of silent majority. And in, in democracies, in our societies, when uh, there is a silent democracy, uh, majority, you never know why they are silent. You might know why they are in majority, but why they are silent. <laughs> and coming back to, to Macron's uh, <coughs> uh, expression, yes, I mean, uh, we are listened, but we, are we understood? Mm. That's a different issue. Heard, yeah. I mean, politeness in listening, it's one thing. Uh, understanding and acting together in partnership is another thing. So I think we passed uh, this kind of uh, uh, stage of ignorance uh, as the uh, Baltics as well as Central Eastern Europeans were called uh, like uh, Russophobes uh, and, uh, and the rest. We are in a stage of to be understood what we've been saying and are saying 
but uh, will we act together things time will show because we're still not in in time of all decisions being enforced and implemented we are far from this mm -hmm. we are not still in a stage of the war economy and europe must go into kind of the war economy right. i am not calling for you know join army tomorrow mm. war economy is something different yes. it's redistribution of resources budgetary resources look at the european union budget european peace facility the most efficient platform for delivering uh, um, ammunition and uh, um, weapons to ukraine it's member states uh, based uh, it's not uh, budgetary uh, you know e eu budgetary mean it's extra budgetary mean mm. so it's absolutely different huh? how we will sustain this we promised ukraine much but did we deliver no not yet not yet and if we're serious i mean we have to rethink it so that's why i hope we will come to an uh, absolutely different stage and, and baltic shouldn't uh, impose only one truth no we have to agree together but we shouldn't be probably opposed with some historical experience uh, and uh, which is really sometimes rich in uh, uh, in in good experience uh, in in the sense and uh, once we look to the eyes of russians not like uh, w bush so we sometimes see different things okay but sharing this and having understanding might save us from future mistakes. What is the difference between Poland and, uh, and Hungary? Uh, maybe Baltics are less linked to some past. Okay, so we are more optimistic and more dynamically um, uh, driving forward. Um, and those political links, uh, in in particular in um, in some countries of, of those two, are very very strong. And uh, that's why. We might in, uh, escape from this, although we, we do have some pop, uh, populist forces in, in our countries. They are not probably so visibly in power, uh, and I hope, I mean, they will not be. But um, who knows? I mean, uh, <laughs> maybe we have to remind ourselves Copenhagen criteria more frequently. <laughs> Thank you. Especially the better, first one. <laughs> yeah, what a better way to end this panel. And... Um, Apologies for rushing you there, um, but there's coffee and we need to stick to the program, the very difficult timetable. So be back at 12.30, otherwise I'll go and get you. Uh, and here we focus on the Western okay, Balkans. Thank you so so 12.30 is where we start. And thanks to our panel once again.
you are very considerate, I must say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's always maybe it's good also. <laughs> about to start again, if you could uh, please find your seats, because we have an excellent panel here once again, and uh, I guess you also want to have lunch at a certain stage, so uh, I'm just trying to get you to sit down, yes, almost there, ah, wonderful. <laughs> Good to see you. Hi. Okay. We will start. Right now in uh, Europe, as we already heard in the uh, panels uh, before us, there's obviously lots of focus on Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia's way into the EU. And we will also focus upon those countries at a later stage, but obviously we should not forget a region which is also extremely important for Europe and the future of Europe, the Western Balkans. And once again, here we have an excellent panel, uh, 45 minutes only, and this time we have four speakers. The core theme of this panel is what role the European go -go, sorry, the Copenhagen criteria will play for the reform process in the Western Balkans. And since we now have four speakers, I mean five minutes when I say five minutes. Otherwise, I will not only move closer to you, I'll do like this. So uh, then I'm sure it's, <laughs> it's okay. Okay, we start with uh, Roman Macuric. You are Deputy Prime Minister for European Affairs of North Macedonia. So the floor is yours. Let's see whether the microphone, well, you're an expert on that as well. Otherwise, yeah, it's a bit strange. Yeah, there you are. Okay. Thank you so much. We are used to Europeans punching on our <laughs> bench, so we, <laughs> we're not afraid of it, but I'll really try to, to keep the time. You know, I was really inspired, and, and, and I feel, feel honored that I'm here and to have this opportunity and inspired by the speeches before, uh, because I was only almost 11 years old when the <laughs> Copenhagen criteria were. Uh, drafted, although I was studying them a lot during my master studies, both in, in the Amsterdam and in London. Um, and I was 20 years old when uh, we had the famous Thessaloniki summit that actually made the commitment, the promise mm -hmm. uh, that at some point looks very sad today, the promise for European perspective of the Western Balkan countries. But I, I'll start with what you have uh, what one of the speakers said about what Prodi commented, Mr. Romano Prodi, the, the president of the commission, uh, commented on, on, on Ukraine, that Ukraine is not part of Europe. I think that poly enlargement policy is actually about that all the time, since the first enlargement in 1973. How to define the core of Europe and how to define what is European Union and, and what is Europe. You, and of course, the, the border changes with the context, because in, back in 1963, if you ask Monsieur le Président de Gaulle, he would say, no, Denmark, UK, and Ireland do not belong to our community. Uh, so I think that those statements are never definite, but those statements are uh, to be lessons that we learn on and build upon in the, in the history. The Copenhagen criteria are the main guide that we have in the uh, negotiation process, and not only in the negotiation process, but also in the, in the transformation of our societies. I think that uh, I used to be a think tanker and, and, and uh, act, uh, societal activist, and I can tell you that those Copenhagen criteria saved my country during the very severe political crisis between 2014 and 2016. Uh, and 17, and those uh, 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 criteria also saved the country back in 2001 when we had an inter-ethnic conflict within the uh, uh, country that finished with the uh, 
action of both the European diplomacy and NATO, Mr. Solana and Mr. Robertson. Mm -hmm. They made a tremendous achievement there based on the, uh, on the program of the Copenhagen criteria, which were then vested into our, into our system and into our constitution much deeper than, than, than before. But I th what concerns us are not the Copenhagen criteria, but the two other, actually three other uh, criteria that are not in the original version. The absorption capacity is there, you, you mentioned that, and I think sometimes that looks to us much more important than any of the Copenhagen criteria related to the political and economic system of our countries. The second is the geostrategic importance, the, the, the next after the uh, absorption capacity, and we should be honest about it. Mm. I think that the Western Balkan countries are not in the European Union for two reasons, because they are surrounded by European Union members, and second, because they are not on the Black Sea or they are not bordering Russia. Otherwise, I am sure that we would be members of the European Union today. But we are surrounded by member states of the European Union. Uh, I also say, as a joke, but it is not a joke, that North Macedonia is lucky that has only two uh, neighboring countries that are coming from the European Union because if we had more, probably we would have to change the constitution more than twice. <laughs> but Serbia has four. Uh, so I think that uh, what I say, say as a joke is just reflection of the mood in the Western Balkans, which is today less optimistic in many of the countries, except probably Albania, uh, than it used to be 20 years ago when we had a Thessaloniki summit. After the Thessaloniki summit, we thought that we can meet the Copenhagen criteria in few years' time, and we have started as North Macedonia. The, we have got the candidate status together with Croatia in 2005, and we have signed the uh, stabilization and association agreement a few months before Croatia in 2001. So our expectations, our hopes, our dreams were that we're gonna become a member of the European Union, if, if not earlier than at least at the same time with Croatia. But the absorption capacity, the geostrategic importance, and the last, the neighboring issues, the, the neighboring countries' issues have deemed to be more important than the Copenhagen criteria at some uh, point and in some episodes. So I think that th this is what we, need, what we need to be honest about and that we need to combine when we uh, draw the map for the next, for the next enlargement. We have been, as a, as a region, through the new approach back in 2015, which has reinforced the Copenhagen criteria, particularly the chapters 23 and 24, and then uh, the, new, the new methodology in 2020. I would like to finish with the, with the new methodology. Uh, back in 2019, at, the, at that time, I was advisor of Prime Minister Zaev for European Affairs, and we were there at the European Council, at the, at the end of 2019, we didn't, get the, uh, we didn't get the start of the negotiations, although we fulfilled all the uh, reforms, all the Copenhagen criteria, and resolved the PRESPA agreement. We've been pushed into a new methodology, which, which today has a lot of good potentials. But that was the moment when the optimism in the Western Balkans and positive showcase has become, uh, has went into a crisis. And that crisis is still going on, and the support of the, the popular support for the EU is dropping in our region. So this should be taken as an, as an alert, because the region is, and I'll speak later on in the questions about that, what is the Russian strategy of the region and how can we counter it? But now I will, uh, I will stop and I can, I can, tell, you, uh, I can tell you that uh, the Copenhagen criteria are, are the best. That's cheating. By saying now I'll stop and then you continue. <laughs> no, ju just to finish, just to finish <laughs> with one <laughs> sentence. That the Copenhagen criteria are really the best uh, defense against the populism in the Western Balkans and the Copenhagen criteria are still the best guidance for transformation in our societies. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. We move on to our next speaker, Minister of European Integration from Serbia, Tanja Miscevic. If I'm not mistaken, uh, you have closed how many uh, chapters at the moment? 22. Yes, that was also written down here. Out of 35. Yes. 
and good to see you again. I remember being in your office uh, debating uh, accession negotiations when you had just been appointed uh, chief negotiator, right? Good, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here for the first time in Copenhagen, uh, in Denmark, uh, to commemorate, to celebrate, let's call it celebrate, the 30 years of Copenhagen criteria. And I do remember of uh, 1993 as a fresh uh, uh, MA student, uh, I've started um, researching European Union at that moment, uh, still in the process of creation of the very European Union, from that side. So my European Union is the European Union of the Copenhagen criteria. Oh. And uh, now I have the opportunity to help my own country in developing further. Uh, what is the difference between the Copenhagen criteria 30 years uh, ago, 20 years of the Thessaloniki agenda for the Western Balkans, and the 10th, years, 10th anniversary of the negotiation process for Serbia? Uh, a lot. The one thing, though, is uh, uh, the, the most important, which is uh, the same, is the geostrategic different geostrategic push back in 30 years ago, even 20 years ago, now we talk about the war in Europe, uh, other issues are completely uh, different. I was very careful listening of the Baltic colleagues, and thank you very much for sharing openly um, um, some of your experiences. And let me start to try to explain how different the, um, the reading not the very criteria, but the reading of the criteria uh, is, uh, is nowadays. Uh, so first, we never had before reading of the Copenhagen criteria as concrete as it is right now. Um, I heard very carefully that it was good that they were uh, abstract at the very beginning because it will be very hard to reach them. So you can imagine how it hard is to reach them now when the result is not the level of the legal approximation, but the track record result. Mm -hmm. So that is what we are providing. In other words, there is no possibility to pursue reforms without the results. And that is what Michaela is uh, actually assessing each and every year, October and, ev and even uh, before that. Is that bad or good if the criteria are getting concrete? Um, I can give you positive and negative assessment, but let's stick with the positive assessment because it's much more concrete blueprint or the guidance for the reforms. It could help us uh, much better, yet on the other hand, it's uh, assessment going into the very details. That's why from time to time, the assessment that we are hearing from Europe member states, but also European institutions, that there is no results of the reform because we are going now into the details. We can discuss, of course, uh, uh, all of those uh, uh, elements. Second difference in reading the Copenhagen criteria uh, today is that they've never been as comprehensive as they are right now. That is what Boyan, uh, mm. Deputy Prime Minister Maricic has said. So for us, in parallel, all three of them plus Madrid criteria, which mm. we should stick also and not mm. forget one, and the emphasis on the absorption capacity. Um, um, a quick snapshot of what is going right now. So there is a discussion of the enlargement, yet the first step is the Swedish document on paper on the absorption capacity of the European Union not the consequences of uh, uh, needed for the candidate country, potential candidate country, to change themselves, but the European Union to change itself. This is a quite contrary than it used to be and that we were uh, listening from, uh, uh, from all of your uh, uh, good experience, uh, good experiences for sure. 
Uh, and then the third element uh, is the un uh, internal reforms, the level uh, of the needed internal reforms before the accession. Uh, look, the emphasis are now on the fundamentals. It's a rule of law plus. The rule of law was not one of the first reforms that has been the, um, the must element or the fundamental element for the big bang uh, or the old enlargement in the beginning of the 21st century. For us, equally important are the uh, both so-called chapters 23 and 24. Uh, as well as the, uh, let me add some additional elements that are very often uh, forgotten. It's the public administration reform horizontally assessed. And it's also the public procurement, which is one of the chapters for the negotiations, which is again the horizontal element for fighting against uh, corruption, which is intrinsic part of the uh, of the uh, uh, rule of the rule of law, that is also uh, an element as uh, we heard of the new methodology. And uh, new methodology is um, an interesting new development because it sticks with the poly with the more political element, bilateral issue should be solved before the entering into the European Union, and that's why we saw a huge jeopardy for the very process. Yet at the other, other, uh, at the, um, other hand, it also introduced the new organizational or new um, uh, ways of organizing ourselves for negotiation process. This is a clustering, and this is something which I also, and uh, that is the end, uh, 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 this is the, the last sentence, that I would like also uh, to draw your attention to. This is a phase in concept which means a little bit more or accelerated integration, regional integration prior uh, with the uh, very, very membership, which is not staged in membership, but phase in mm -hmm. into the integration. Uh, into the integration process. So we do not uh, uh, have a problem with the Copenhagen criteria as such. Um, we, this is still a blueprint for our reforms. The, um, the um, concrete, co uh, being much more concrete than before is possible problem and possible jeopardy for the Western Balkan six. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, also for highlighting the Madrid criteria, I mean, about administrative capacity. Uh, I think that was also important because it shows the development of the Copenhagen criteria. Next up is Albania. Um, and we'd like to hear also from you, obviously, how you look upon the uh, process. Uh, if my research is correct, uh, you speak uh, not only English, but Albanian, Spanish, Mandarin, Italian, or Greek. Um, my Mandarin is pretty rusty, uh, so uh, let's stick uh, to English. Uh, the floor is yours. I think I'll, I'll keep it in English as well, just yep. for everyone's <laughs> sake. Um, Oops, I just have to see. Does it, yeah, yeah, is it work. working? Yeah. No. Um, but also to add on to what was said in the previous panels, I think in, in this panel as well, we're uh, testaments to the fact that the Copenhagen uh, criteria keeps you young. So. Um, uh, yeah, thank you <laughs> to the, um, on behalf of the Minister for Europe and Foreign Affairs of Albania as well, Ms. Jacka, thank you very much for having us here, for inviting us and to the host for organizing this, this event. We really appreciate uh, Denmark's support on our EU accession path, but also I would like to commend Denmark's approach on the new foreign and security policy strategy. Um, but really, it's a distinct honor to be able to celebrate this anniversary of the Copenhagen criteria uh, with all of you today. Uh, it's a precious Danish legacy, but dare I say, not just a Danish legacy, but I think a milestone for all of us. And that's because it was precisely the creation of the Copenhagen criteria that opened the door for the reunification of a um, forcefully divided uh, EU about five decades ago due to geopolitical considerations, ideology, authoritarian will. So the Copenhagen criteria proved to be a success to the enlargement project and also uh, 
a guiding light, because I know the Madam Moderator mentioned it in the opening mm -hmm. remarks, but a guiding light for both the EU, but also for Albania and for the countries uh, of our region of the Western Balkans. And I say this with conviction, because they are at the core of the merit-based uh, enlargement policy of the Union, but also at the heart of all the work that we have done and that we continue to do, uh, and the actions that we take when it comes to the rule of law, the open market economy, and respect for human rights. And of course, our path uh, towards the EU accession has had its fair share of setbacks and challenges, just as the EU five decades ago. We've also had politicization, individualization to the detriment of the credibility and predictability of, um, that the Copenhagen criteria instilled in the EU's framework. But we remain committed to the fact that reform programs must be implemented, that we have to deliver and we are delivering, because as it has been said previously as well, EU membership remains the top priority for all of us. And more specifically on Albania, um, Albania, uh, Albania's new democratic and free uh, world as we know it was uh, born at the same time as the Copenhagen criteria. And this has been a compass for us actually um, as countries that aspire to be part of the EU. The goals that we've had since the 90s are um, the same objectives, stable democracy, rule of law, functioning market economy, and we share that of course with the EU. And these priorities have been upheld by the government, but not only that, they've been um, supported by the full spectrum, by the opposition, by civil uh, society, by academia, uh, private sector. And Albania, for that matter, remains to be one of the most pro-European uh, countries after 30 years still. As I mentioned, we already share the same values with the EU, but now it's really about strengthening our core in order to translate these values into tangible results. Um, and since 2014, since Albania received the candidate uh, status, the Copenhagen criteria were converted, converted into the preconditionalities to open accession negotiations with the EU, preconditionalities that uh, we've met Hence, we started the accession negotiations last July, on the 19th of July of last year. Um, but even before that date, we have been working closely with the EU, with our partners and allies, to preserve and defend the EU's core values in which we wholeheartedly believe in. And some of this work um, that, we've, uh, that it consists in the justice reform, which is an advanced uh, stage of implementation, fully functional and producing tangible and long-awaited results. The new judiciary self-governance institutions, were, which are fully uh, operational and have shown transparency, accountability, professionalism, and efficiency in the justice system. The transitional reevaluation of judges and prosecutors. The Albanian government has put a multitude effort in fighting uh, corruption at all levels and engaged in um, protecting um, the fundamental rights and its national regulations complying with the international European human rights standards. Public administration, as was mentioned by the uh, distinguished panelists as well, uh, we've made very good progress in terms of policy making, integrated policy planning, uh, and strengthening of public financing management. So there is really no doubt uh, to our dedication to the objectives of building a European Albania by fulfilling the conditions, meeting the political criteria. And we would like to continue to maintain this pace, the pace of positive successes and positive movement of 2022. And our goal in 2023 is um, the, that the Council approves the screening report for the fundamentals cluster through the opening, through the second IGC, but also as was uh, mentioned in the previous panels as well. On the other hand, there is the fourth Copenhagen criteria which is that the EU must be ready also to absorb newcomers. And everything that relates to this discussion is very important, and we should have this discussion when it comes to the EU's homework in preparing for the absorption of newcomers, be it institutional reform or the finance, financial aspects, conversion, access to union programs and, and policies and so on. And because it's only through this way that the um, proclaimed objectives of the EU accession can become real, true and tangible for all of us. Excellent. Thank you very much.
And there was even a bridge to our next uh, speaker from the European Commission, Michaela Matuella. You have worked with enlargement uh, and neighborhood policy for many, many years, but as we can see, the Copenhagen criteria keeps you young. Um, you work with Croatia, Romania, so uh, what's your sort of take on the uh, Copenhagen criteria? Uh, are they still sort of uh, precise enough? Uh, should they, or have they become too precise? And what about the changes to the Copenhagen criteria over time? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and it's really a pleasure to be part of the celebration of the uh, 30th anniversary of the Copenhagen Criteria. As you said, I've been uh, dealing with uh, uh, these matters for, for a number of years, and in fact, if I can add a, a personal touch to it, um, I realized while I was flying here that uh, this month is actually my 20th anniversary of dealing with the Copenhagen Criteria. So I add that to the list of all the uh, anniversary that we have uh, uh, this year. Uh, now, on, uh, uh, on your questions, I mean, it's clear that the Copenhagen criteria are very much at the center of the enlargement process, and they are still as relevant as ever uh, today that we are in a completely different context when we talk about enlargement policy after a number of years of uh, a different, uh, let's say, uh, if you want, uh, uh, general uh, political support to the enlargement policy. The enlargement policy is back at the center of the uh, of the EU uh, inches, and that's clear. And as it has been mentioned, this is certainly the result of many factors, but clearly the war on Ukraine and the implications of the war on Ukraine is, is part of that. So very relevant indeed. Uh, and why are they still relevant? I, uh, I joined, unfortunately, only uh, very late into the discussion this morning, but I, I, I did uh, hear uh, some of the previous speakers referring to the Copenhagen criteria being very vague. And of course, they, that's why also they remain very relevant today, because they are essentially basic principles. And the basic principles remains, of course, essential for the transformation that uh, is necessary for the enlargement countries to become ready for membership. Um, but at the same time, what we have done in the Commission is to adapt the uh, implementation of the Copenhagen criteria to, in a way, two factors, if you want. One are the needs and the lessons learned. Uh, and the other one is also the general context. So in terms of the needs, uh, is, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm referring now to, and I'll come back now to the revised uh, methodology, and in terms of the overall context, it's clear that also the elements related to common foreign security policy and the alignment to that is clearly a contextual element that has, of course, injected uh, uh, also, uh, if you want, a different uh, attention to this, to this type of issues. But now focusing on the... Um, on the revised methodology. The methodology clearly has evolved in the years. Uh, now we, uh, Boyan referred to the revised methodology. The revised methodology is already the result of a number of uh, steps in the process. And uh, uh, I was part of the fifth enlargement. I was part of the negotiations with uh, Croatia. And there was clearly an evolution in particular on what we call the fundamentals. But the fundamentals also have evolved. We were talking about chapter 23 and 24 towards Croatia and post-Croatia. But now the fundamentals have been expanding in what we have created with the revised methodology in this new cluster, the cluster one that has uh, kind of replaced, let's say, the narrative around chapter 23 and 24 that everybody knows about. But it's basically a cluster that covers all the fundamentals. It's rule of law, it's public administration reform. Public administration reform now in negotiation is going to have a much more prominent uh, role. Functional democratic institutions. We have taken that for granted in a way. When we start the negotiations is because we consider the political criteria fulfilled. And therefore, these issues somehow, not that were not covered, but somehow they were a little bit in the background. Now they are back at the forefront because there is, as part of the requirement, also um, the preparation of a, of a roadmap on the functioning democratic institution, but also public procurement and economic criteria. So these are now the, sort of the new definition of, uh, of fundamentals. And here, let me bring up a new, uh, let's say, dimension into the methodology. This is called the methodology for accession. There are, of course, a number of complementary tools that we have to support the countries preparing for it, because that is the essence of the Copenhagen criteria, is guiding the countries to prepare for becoming member states. Another instrument that was launched by President von der Leyen just a few weeks uh, ago in Bratislava is the growth plan. Mm. The growth plan is not an alternative to accession, not at all. It's exactly an instrument to accelerate the preparation for accession. Uh, the concept of accelerated integration has been uh, mentioned by, uh, by Tanya. This is part of it, but beyond. This growth plan essentially has four dimensions. Integration into the single market, 
this is clearly part of uh, uh, preparation for a section, creation of a common regional market within the region. There is no point in working on integration in the single market if the region is also not more integrated uh, economically. And then linking this with the reform process and what the Commission has proposed is additional financial resources that are all tools to basically um, uh, push for an acceleration of the preparation because that is the objective. That's what we want to see. And uh, let's face it, um, when it comes to the pace of the reforms, we would like to see more because without the reforms, in spite of the new geopolitical context, it is impossible to move forward uh, uh, on, uh, on membership. Um, and I, let me add one uh, comment, and then I conclude with one final remark, um, so that I prepare the ground. You know, I'm Italian. You know, you give, giving me five minutes is, is, is very cruel. Oh, yeah, but you're <laughs> doing fine. You're doing fine. <laughs> um, there is a, a clearly an opportunity that has been created with all, of course, the, the, you know, the, the tragedy that comes with a very sad part of our history, the war on Ukraine. There is an opportunity that has been created on which I think that also the Western Balkans should uh, you know, um, capture. Um, there is a different uh, um, uh, attitude towards uh, uh, enlargement, and it needs to be exploited. It needs to be exploited to, uh, to, to, to move forward, to move forward faster. But the only way to do that is uh, to implement uh, the reforms that are necessary to become member states. And there is maybe a tendency in the narrative in the Western Balkans to look at the trio and what is happening in the trio as a threat to the Western Balkans. It's not. It's the opposite. It's mm -hmm. really creating new opportunities. Let's use the opportunities to move forward. Because at the end of the day, uh, the accession criteria have not changed. We have tried to make them more clear, more explicit, exactly to, and that is the mantra of our revised methodology, to make the process more credible, more dynamic, more predictable, with more political steer, because what we want is really an acceleration of um, uh, the process. And we made it, and, and we made the, um, the implementation of the economic criteria uh, not more challenging. The objective is not to make the life more difficult of the Western Balkans. The idea is, on the contrary, uh, to um, make sure that we have better tools to prepare uh, the Western Balkans for becoming uh, um, member states and therefore to make the EU uh, stronger, more united, uh, because that, I think, is clearly in our interest, uh, first of all, uh, to expand uh, to uh, our mem the membership of the European Union to the Western Balkans and to the trio. I'll stop here. Thanks. Wonderful. Now we have uh, 15 minutes for your questions and responses up here. So who would like to ask the first question? Well, I count on you, Dav. That, that, that's good. Yes, hello. Uh, Uffe Wiedkjær uh, from Denmark and uh, Europe Dialogue. Uh, I think the countries on Western Balkan has been very patient with 20 years of European perspective. perspective. We have a new player in, uh, in the field, uh, EPC, European Political Community, with more than 40 countries, with members of EU and non-members. And there has been two meetings, one in EU, Czech Republic, and also Moldova. So this new forum, does it give you any hope as a help in the enlargement process? Thank you. So the EPC, as it is also called. Any other question? Yes. Paul, <laughs> from the P panel, yes? Yes. Um, my question relates to implementation. Um, I think, going back to my enlargement, so to speak, that it was a very important part of the preparation for enlargement that we had this exchange of officials and experts, European officials and experts going to the uh, candidate countries, helping with their experience in, uh, back home in preparing for this, uh, for the enlargement, both because it gave I think useful technical advice, but also it was part of this people-to-people -people contact, which I myself considered an mm -hmm. important element in the first 
enlargement. My simple question is, to what extent is that applied today? Excellent. Um, you don't have to respond to, or you can't respond to all of, all of the questions, um, but the EPC, the question of experts, and then there is also an opportunity to reflect on public support, uh, West Balkans, with regards to uh, membership. I saw, Tanya, that uh, your presidency said has said that, that there is not uh, as much enthusiasm about the EU as it used to be, because the EU is not as enthusiastic about Serbia as it used to be. So, um, so you have a number of questions on your plate, so uh, feel free to see which one you'd like to answer. Oh, and we see you already sort of almost <laughs> pressed the button. So yeah, yeah, go ahead. It's very ungrateful to speak first on such a good panel, but <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try to reflect on, on, on many things. Uh, the, the question of uh, the Copenhagen criteria and the fundamentals are actually questions of European values. The European values are really important and matter to us as candidate countries because they define the identity of the European Union that we would like to join, and they define the, our identity in which we recognize the, the, the aspirations for the European Union. And so this, this is how I see the, the Copenhagen criteria and the fundamentals, the first cluster. Mm. Other than that, I can tell you, yeah, we have started together with Albania the, the negotiations. We are f following the screening process quite successfully, and we will give our best to set the stage for successful negotiation process in the future. I'm also chief negotiator mm. of our team. but. Uh, let me reflect on, on the values and EPC. This is how I wanted to, to make a link. Uh, the European political community, in my opinion, is an excellent way to socialize with the European Union, but it, it cannot be a substitute. I, I see it as an as a, uh, excellent way to exercise the European Council uh, for, for, for the future. And we need more of these formats. I was, uh, a, a year ago, I think it, it, it was when I visited Prague, it was actually last September, and I was begging the European Minister of, of, of uh, Czech Republic, Mr. Beck, to include us into the energy uh, <laughs> ministerial meeting, uh, the countries from the Western Balkans, because we were the first to embrace, on the very first day, the sanctions against Russia and to support the uh, Ukraine to sit <coughs> by, by their side, not because we were calculating the consequences, but because we thought it was the right thing to do. But the consequences came later, mm -hmm. and we were supposed to solve them together. And we, need to solve, we needed to solve together also the migration crisis of 2015, the crisis of uh, the COVID crisis, and of course the crisis uh, uh, provoked by the aggr Russian aggression to Ukraine. So we need to socialize at many mm -hmm. levels. This is how I see the, the political community as a chance of the leaders to sit, but we need <coughs> much more formats of, of that kind if, if we would like to, uh, to, to be more so, uh, socialized. On the, on the question on implementation of the experts. Up, that's why I'm sort of standing here. <laughs> Go ahead. If we are, uh, I would like to answer the question, sure. sorry. Um, I have, for, uh, there are a lot of opportunities and we are using many of them. Uh, of course, there is a precious support by the, the so-called UNOPS program, Norway and Sweden for the Western Balkans. And Denmark can also think of joining that because it's very useful. For example, I have the former Croatian chief negotiator, Mr. Drobniak, as my advisor because of that program and it, 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 is, it is very useful. My last sentence is that uh, we need to set a calendar if we want to have success. Mm. It's not the only thing, but it will motivate us because we are struggling with the reforms because it's not tangible. The, the EU membership is not tangible. This is why it's going down in the public support. Mm. If you ask people in North Macedonia uh, how many of them are now for EU membership, it would go up to 65%. It was 85% three years ago. Mm. Now it's 65%. But when you ask of those 65%, when do you think North Macedonia will join? One third of them would say never. <laughs> one third of them would say, I don't know. And one third of them would say in 10, 15, 20 years, when I'm much older. So 
the, I think that once we have a stage, to, to, the EU needs to decide to make, a, uh, to make a success story of the Western Balkans. That's only possible if we have a date, uh, indicative date for accession, 2030. This is our idea, 2030. If we can manage this, it will be a success story. If we do not deliver on reforms, it can move to 35 or 32, but we need to have a motivation because otherwise it's only a nice story that goes on for 20 years. Thank you. We'll tell the Danish Minister of Foreign Affairs who will launch. Tanya? Yeah, let me start with the last sentence that Boyan said. The target year, the year 2030, is needed also for organizing yourself. So in order to go backward in terms of knowing when we are going to introduce some of those uh, activities. Uh, but um, uh, uh, one thing is also important. We are not starting from the same level of alignment like the beginning of the 90s. Don't forget the Western Balkans, all of us, we are for 20 years in the process of applying the Copenhagen Criteria Plus. That is, uh, uh, we were talking here, uh, all three of our country, we already introduced the constitutional reforms needed for the uh, reform of judiciary, but also some other things. That is a quite different story than it used to be. EPC, good tool, good format. Of course, uh, it, it's not the replacement for the enlargement process, but it's also always very good to be in the society where you can meet some people for the first time or exchange uh, uh, for the first time or even to sit and to discuss as a region, as you might see, it, ha it used to be, it was the, the case for the Western Balkans uh, sitting in Chisinau uh, in some <coughs> nice backyard discussing about the common problems and the issue. That is always an extremely important element. Sharing the experience is equally important. Uh, just before this, uh, but le let me give you another level. Just before this panel, I had a meeting with the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Georgia, no, Moldova, sorry, Moldova, because Boyan and I, we met a few days ago, and together with our colleague, chief negotiator from, uh, uh, from Albania, Madame Duca, we are going to prepare a format of chief negotiators from the region to help the, the trio. Uh, in sharing our own experience. It's good the experience of Croatia that might help, but actually uh, we are now much more experienced uh, mm -hmm. to share the new type of uh, expertise and uh, methodolo methodology. But uh, even we learn even from the mistakes of the previous mm -hmm. uh, enlargement waves. Excellent, we move on to, who would like to respond? Yeah. It's due to the current geopolitical situation, the world as we know it today, you know, it's changing very rapidly, it's very fast paced, it's very fluid, very dynamic. It's, uh, it feels like there's no constants. But for us, it seems like the uh, Albania's commitment to the EU is the only constant that exists. <laughs> so we, I'd like to touch upon the fact of the, the, of the support and yes, uh, from what Boyan also mentioned, uh, it's true that in Albania and for Albanians, there is an enormous uh, popular support when it comes to the EU integration. But of course, it's also true that that should not be taken for granted. Mm. Um, and uh, Albanian has, uh, has been a, Albania has been a factor of stability um, for the region. But I think we go by three, three main, main points, unity, synergy, reliance. And this is what we've been um, offering for both regional stability, but also uh, in terms of um, our policies abroad. And I think this is what we've shown, uh, how we conduct our foreign policy as well. Um, we were OSC chair in, back mm -hmm. in 2020, uh, NATO member state. We're currently a UN Security Council non-permanent member. So these are all things that we need to consider. These are all part of what has been said here, of things that we're continuously working, working towards. The EPC, again, it's, any format that can bring us closer to, 
together sorry, to discuss pertinent issues, pertinent questions that affect not just our region, but the whole European continent is, of course, very welcome. It's the things that are um, proof to keep us together, such as the strong European values that we, that we all share. And to this end, we've been very proactive. We've been very proactive in different formats, um, in regional cooperation formats, but also um, beyond that. And I would just like to end it by um, perhaps giving it a slightly um, more positive uh, or optimistic note, uh, because we all want to see and hear success stories. And I think we started having it last year, mm -hmm. but that momentum should be kept mm -hmm. because we need other success stories uh, for not just for our region but for the whole European continent and the successes uh, will be bring back um, this very spirit of the EU uh, itself and of the EU enlargement policy. And I am very cruel and speak about success stories. My success story is finalizing this on time so one minute! One minute. <laughs> oh, microphone. Yep. And now it's Right. Uh, no, very briefly, I will not comment on EPC. There was more a question for uh, the representatives of the countries, but I would like to build on what uh, uh, all, all of you have said, which is the, the link with the um, uh, let's say participation in different council configuration. This is an important point, but it goes a little bit beyond. I think what we have done, apart from also, uh, also on our side supporting, uh, let's say, going down that road, but in general terms, we clearly have common challenges for many reasons, um, including geographical proximity. Uh, and those challenges are better addressed if we find common solutions. So in areas such as, just to mention some, energy, uh, migration, mm. um, climate change, uh, you know, uh, and of course the economic integration, I mean, there is a lot that we can do together and therefore any forum that allows us to uh, bring ideas together and find common solutions, I think we are certainly in support of that. On the implementation front, and you mentioned these exchanges uh, between um, experts from uh, the different administrations. Uh, this is still there, it's a very powerful instrument, not only the twinning uh, uh, mm. programs, but also the TIEX. Um, it's, it's very punctual intervention, you know, the Commission cannot uh, uh, be there on, on every, mm. we don't have the capacity to deal with everything. We clearly rely on experts from member states. There is an important dimension of peer-to-peer uh, also advice which has a different value and uh, this instrument not only is there, is stronger and also we made it much more flexible in some of the, uh, the aspects, so absolutely in agreement. Then a final word on the uh, public support. Um, this is uh, uh, essential. It's essential uh, not only because now we have new challenges, because of course what comes with the war on Ukraine came also, of course, a challenge in terms of uh, misinformation, disinformation that makes also also the public support and the support of the European Union even you know more more complex. But in general, apart from this particular challenge, let's not forget that the transformation that comes with the accession process is is thorough and it's. Of course, uh, it's, it's difficult and sometimes, you know, of course, uh, uh, it's also difficult to explain to the cities and we have seen it's a very normal trend to basically have the decrease of the support. Um, so it's very important that we work together. Uh, this is a clearly mm. a joint challenge to work together to explain better mm. uh, the whole process because this is, will be essential to, uh, you know, it will accompany this challenge, will accompany us till the very end of the negotiations process, but will continue also when the countries will become member states, because we see it also with member states. Excellent. I, and I promise that we'll touch upon public support later, both in the candidate countries, but also in the member states. Uh, this concludes the first part of our conference. Now there is lunch, but please remain seated for two minutes because I need to have all the speakers out to take a photograph, I've been told. Uh, the program will uh, resume after lunch, sharp, and I mean sharp, at 2.30 with a keynote speaker from the Foreign Minister of Denmark, Lars Lykke Rasmussen, so 2.30. After that, we'll also have the uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine, Lunch will be served right out there, but as I said, please remain seated and I thank you to our panel.